Hello everyone and welcome to another Throwback Thursday. Uh, I am here flying solo. Steven, my compatriot, is gone. Had a lot of stuff to get done, so I'm, I'm giving him the day to, to work on some other things and I'm here hanging out playing the Middle Earth CCG solo. Last time I streamed this, uh, I was actually flying solo on a throwback. What up, chat? Uh, and I did my first deck building, so I'm gonna actually be going over that deck again today. But then the other thing I was doing, I started working on a solo variant of this game because it is, I, I don't know what happened, but I played that first time with Steven on a throwback several months ago, and it just gets in your blood and in your bones. So I've been wanting to get it back to the table, and I, I took the chance when I was solo streaming on a Thursday to, to build my first deck. And then obviously uh, we're in isolation and whatnot, not a lot of people to necessarily play against. So. Found some ideas online on how to maybe play a little bit solo. Had some ideas off of that, started working on uh, that setup. And so I'll be going over the deck, how to play if you're new to the game and you're also looking to play solo. I know a lot of people have been picking up those challenge decks for the middle or CCG. Uh, this, will, this will probably be a good one for you, but it's gonna be super chill, laid back, uh, interacting with the chat quite a bit. If you're very familiar with this game, feel free to say stuff if I get any rules wrong. There's a lot of little interactions. This is a game from the 90s, so it's got a lot of the classic 1990s card game variants and rules, all kinds of different stuff thrown at you, and it's Lord of the Rings, so it's very much built to feel. Uh, I always uh, the way we talk about it on stream is like it feels like you're reading a book when you're playing, and it definitely achieves that. But that means there's a, a whole lot of nuance. Matt saying, "Did you turn the map map into a board?" So I'm going to go ahead and switch down real quick to the other angle, so you can see it. Now this is a, a printed map that comes with the game. Probably one of my favorite parts of this game is the the way they integrated the map. And it, it makes a lot of sense for what they were trying to achieve thematically. Um, and I'll, I'll move these cards off so you can get a full look at it. But basically, one of the key components of the game is the fact that you're kind of traveling around Middle Earth, going where you want to go, and you're exploring, and you, you have various stuff you're trying to achieve. But you literally, I have these two miniatures here from... Uh, sky tear that Stephen and I painted. So I'm going to use the red one to represent Aragorn and the green one to represent my Faramir group. And if I happen to get Gandalf going and he gets his own group, I have this like purple translucent one. So that's just going to mark where I'm at on the map. And uh, it's it's so cool because uh, basically the this pitch for the solo variant that I, I was working on last time is I basically wanted to be able to build the uh, free people's side of a deck and then take it into Middle Earth and have we've been playing a lot of Arkham Horror and um, Marvel Champions and so those are cooperative games that the the like enemy decks are kind of built for you to play against and Arkham particularly is very much a campaign style journey where you're playing through so I wanted to see if I could kind of get a, a blend of those two and and create a system that would allow me to take my free people's half of my deck and just do whatever I wanted in Middle Earth because that's a, you know, playing a full game with two players, uh, there's a, like, I think Steven and I's learning game took five or six hours when we were live doing that. And so this allows me to just basically very quickly get it to the table and see if it's working. And I did a couple just very quick, not like full run throughs of the solo variant um, just to see how it was functioning. And I, I made some adjustments based on that, but it was pretty cool because I, I very quickly, between building a deck and then exploring a, a solo format like that, uh, it just started to click. The game clicked a lot more for me, so hopefully watching this will be super helpful for you. Before I dive in, check in with chat. How are we doing out there? What's going on on a Thursday? Uh, and if you're watching, do you already play Middle Earth CCG? Are you interested in playing Middle Earth CCG? Or have you already bought it and you're just looking how to learn how to play? I'm curious who all is out there and, and what brings you to the table today. What up, Mike Cook? <laughs> Saying, is this heroic five smog attempt? Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm a little too uh, inexperienced at this game to try to create a heroic scenario for me. TL says, you're the reason I bought all the challenge decks. That's fantastic. Uh, well, welcome. Hopefully this is super helpful for you. Chris saying, I'm a player. I've been. Uh, how long have you been playing, Chris? How familiar are you with this game? Caleb says, I've always wanted to try this game. Carteret says, I got my Order of Ashes from Plat Hat and I'm ready to dig in. Well, we streamed yesterday if you missed that, and we'll be streaming on Wednesdays for, for at least a couple weeks um, for Ashes, so I'm very much looking forward to continuing to explore all these new cards. Ian says, I haven't seen this one. Middle Earth CCG, I think it was from 1995, 96, from Iron Crown Enterprises, ICE for short. 
and it's a beautiful game. Like, let's pull up, um, uh, let me pull up a, a good location. Uh, let's just pull up uh, Glittering Caves will be a good one. That's a, a fun piece of art. There's a few that are just like, there's a lot actually, read a lot that are super striking. Um, where's that? But yeah, it's a, uh, it's just got this like, uh, I think the the art style. Someone identified it last time, which is basically the difference between digital art and physical art. I think a lot of this is older art that was physically painted and scanned in and used on these cards. And it's just got this like the between the map and then the art itself, it just has this like very majestic feel where you kind of feel like you're in a storybook. Yeah, they show the one ring. I love that art. Herman saying, I traded all my Lord of the Rings TCG cards in for Middle Earth CCG cards when I left the competitive scene. Preferred the art more and the chill way to play, but I rarely got to play it. Jonathan saying, after last stream, I bought four challenge decks and a box of the White Hand. Nice. Derek saying, 95 to 98. Yep, the glory years. Uh, 42 saying, played since the stuff was still fresh in the shelves. Yeah, I was a little kid. I, I got into the Star Wars uh, CCG. Well, it was Pokemon first, and then picked up some discount Star Wars CCG packs, but I didn't even know this was a thing until I was a little bit older. I remember seeing a, the box with the eye on it um, at like a future Gen Con. It was, it was probably a decade plus later. There's, there's always those vendors that just have a sm hodgepodge of all kinds of different stuff that, that they're selling um, at Gen Con. So I remember seeing it and being interested, but then I, I started hearing people talk about it, which is why I eventually picked up those challenge decks. Matt says, I'm in your third category. I picked up a couple challenge decks after your last solo stream after being captivated by your first. I've been fascinated with solo mode, so this is great. Well, welcome. I'm, I'm excited. It'll be as a learning experience for me as it is for you probably because I, I've done some very basic tests of the system, um, and I'm sure that there will be some improvements that I'll make as we actually start to play. Apparently, Luke's saying Ice also made the Middle Earth RPG. Um, which the art could obviously be from there as well. Derek's saying they included some solo scenarios and custom cards in the back of some of the Middle Earth RPG books. Uh, was a neat tie-in. That's super cool. I also have... Where is it at? Here it is. They had this thing. I think they did this for each set. This is the Wizard's Companion. It's like a book. Um, and in the back of it, they have a bunch of scenarios. And there were a couple solo ones in here. But all the scenarios I saw uh, online were basically trying to mimic a certain piece of the story. So... There's one scenario where you're trying to destroy the One Ring. There's one scenario where you're trying to go, uh, you know, uh, the Bilbo with the dwarves are going uh, to steal something from Smog and get back to the, the Shire. Uh, and so what I was looking for is, like, I, I want to be able to, like, build and test actual decks, but then also kind of more just like an open world feeling where I felt like I could just explore the universe of Middle-earth, go where I wanted to go based on whatever my characters are trying to do, and if I could create something that would do that, then I essentially have uh, the you know the world. It's just wide open options for what you can do with this game. I could build the deck trying to destroy the One Ring, and I built the deck so that it would it would feel like when I'm you know going to Mount Doom, it's going to feel like uh, I'm facing the challenges of going to Mount Doom. Obviously, super risky to go there. Josh Wilson saying this was such a great game. Played it when it first came out at Heroes Con and won a replica Wizards ring that matched the card artwork. That's fantastic. Thomas says, I played it before the Preconstructeds came out. Andre is saying he has a has starter for 20 years and never touched it until Steven and I played. And since then, he's been obsessed. That's so amazing. I can't imagine holding out of that for 20 years and not opening it or not actually playing. But I get it, right? The, the rules are not... Um, it's classic 90s rules. They have that little rule book the size of a card so it would fit in those tuck boxes with a deck. And it's just dense. It's 50, 60. I mean, this half of this big book is a, is a rule book and deck building it seems it's actually way more complicated than I thought it or it's way less complicated than I expected it to be based on reading the rules uh, but it's just it, it's a captivating game it's hard to explain it's got this kind of like X factor that's hard to describe Mark saying I, I'm with Zach on this one I like the idea of playing in a sandbox style environment middle earth game then with a dedicated super focused deck that only does specific things yeah, we'll see if it works. Um, Derek says, I'm working on tinkering with an Arda list right now. So Arda is also another system designed to kind of play solo play. And there were definitely some things I liked about it. Um, and then there were some things that I, I wasn't as keen on. One of the big things here is I built this deck, which I'll run through in a second. Um, and it's basically in the game, you have half 
good cards and half bad cards in your deck, like your, uh, you know, Nazgul or your Goblins, etc. So this is literally just the one half of the deck, and then I can basically test and tweak this. Obviously, it's not going to be quite the same as having the, you know, the other cards in your deck, and, the, you know, that changes how you're drawing. Do you want uh, Doors of Night or Gates of Morning in play? All kinds of those kind of considerations. Um, PR is saying, I've been struggling a bit with learning the rules. Well, hopefully this helps a little bit. Uh, there's definitely a lot of little nuanced things going on, and it can be uh, pretty easy to trip up on. I actually posted a... Let me find it really quick. So basically, I went through the rules and made a shorthand when we were going into our last stream of like, here's the key things to remember. Um, and I, I'm going to reference that today because I haven't, <laughs> haven't really played uh, since. I've, I've tested this out just a little bit. Um, I'm going to link to that in the chat. Hopefully that'll be helpful. Yeah, movement that was definitely something uh, that was somewhat difficult to understand. But once it clicks, it, it, it super clicks. All right. So I'm going to run down my deck real quick just to give some context for what's going on. And before I do that, let me talk a little bit about the way this works. So if you look at this map, um, as an example, uh, Rohan here that I can see, it's got this icon. It's a, the white circle with like a tower that's half black and half white in it. And you'll see my beautiful illustrations here. I use sticky notes. So I have uh, the circle with the tower with the half on it. And basically, I built a deck and I sleeved all these different ones in different colors. So like this one uh, happens to be yellow, whereas the circle with the fully colored in black tower is orange. Um, that's just for me to like easily be able to see the difference. But basically, every card in this deck uh, keys to that uh, kind of location. So like when you're typically playing in deck building uh, and your opponent goes to Rohan as an example, that's one of the, the icons that's going to be on that location. That, and that means you can key your bad guys to it. So as an example, let's pull up the abductor. Uh, and you'll see on the left side of his card, he's got that same icon, which is the white circle behind the tower that's half black, half white. He also has the half black, half white icon. So he can be played key into either of those locations. And the way the site path is built is, you know, if someone went from, uh, let's find, uh, trying to read the lights reflecting off it. Oh, just give me one second. Figures you start diving into it, and then that's when the postal guy shows up to, to drop something off that you've been waiting on. Um, so movement, the way it works, right, is uh, like if this red miniature here I had was at Rohan, and I wanted to move to, mm, let's see, where would it make sense? Let's say I want to go to Minas Tirith, which is here. So for me to get there, I'm going to have to go from Rohan through Anorian, right, which is right here, and it extends all the way to here. Then I'm going to have to go into the Lebanon region, which is where Minas Tirith is. And then, of course, I'm going to have to go to Minas Tirith. So there's a literal Minas Tirith card, which I'll pull up. I have all my locations here. I love this art. Goodness, I love the art in this game. So Minas Tirith, you'll see a few things. One, in the top left corner, you'll actually see on the map it matches two if you end up with one of these maps. Um, Minas Tirith has this, uh, the, this is that uh, white circle with the, uh, actually, no, that's just the, the tower. So it's just got the, the tower. I don't think it has the white circle behind it. But anyways, on the top left of this card all the way down, you'll see the site path. So technically, in like the introductory rules, they, they have you, instead of figuring out what the site path is on the map, they actually have you just reference the, the icons on the left here. So when you move to Minas Tirith, your opponent basically gets to play things that would naturally make sense for it to show up on your route to Minas Tirith. And in the basic version of movement, the, all those icons are right here. So you'll see the wilderness, that like tree logo. So you had to go through wilderness to get to Minas Tirith. So maybe you'll run into some spiders or some wolves. Uh, but in the actual full-on gameplay movement, what you would do is you would basically, any, anything that you go through forms that site path, right? So Anorian as a region um, has a certain uh, logo printed in it, right? 
and then basically that continues along as you go. So you can figure out what, uh, what kind of things were in your site path, and that's going to tell you what kind of enemies can key you to your location. And so what I'm going to do, uh, and this is how I built my solo uh, <laughs> villains to work, essentially, is I'm going to you know, go through my site path, but then the threat limit basically is how many, how many bad cards your opponent can play on you when you're moving. And so the minimum is two. You have, if you have one character, you have 100 characters, it's two. But technically, it can be increased by the number of characters in a party. So like if I have Aragorn, and of course Arwen's hanging out with him, and they're moving around, right? I have two, two characters in my party. So the minimum is two. When they're moving around, my opponent can play two cards against me during the hazard phase. Uh, technically, if I threw in Faramir and Annalena, and I had a four-party group, and I move, there could be four cards that come out against me. And so what I essentially want to simulate is when I'm moving, right, uh, part of the game is that when you're deck building, certain um, basically, are they called creatures even? There's a tiny, yeah, creatures, uh, like the abductor, is keyed to certain regions. And so he can be played in certain areas. But what you find out and what, I, what you kind of start realizing, because I, I played the Lord of the Rings TCG a lot, like a, a, a good bit when I was a teenager. And my... Typical strategy there was I ran, because that was also you had half fellowship and half uh, minions. And my what I like to do is run a fellowship that was like really, really solid at, at moving slow and being very safe. Um, and like, not necessarily moving slow, moving fast, but being safe. So it was like lighter, lighter number of ca uh, characters, so they got less twilight, so they could play less stuff. And then I would cancel, and that's how this deck's actually going to function a little bit. Uh, but then... I really loved playing the Nazgul because they were awesome in that game. So, and you could actually, it was very reasonable for you to win the game on the minion phase. And especially because of the way the, the Twilight stacks up towards the end. So, on the flip side, this game, the more I play it, the more I start recognizing that like the hazard side of your deck is less about um, actually defeating your opponent and way more about causing them problems slash slowing them down. Like just, you know, you, you don't win by like destroying a certain character. At the ultimately, you win the game by scoring points. And uh, points, you'll see a card like uh, let me find one of my point cards. Like Narsal is uh, obviously Aragorn's sword. On the top left, it's got that square box with a three in it. So the three is the number of points you get if you have this card in play when the game ends. Now, a couple of things. Like if your opponent doesn't score uh, in a specific category, like you'll see another type is like Knights of Dole Amroth. These are a faction, and they've got like a triangle behind it, and those, those icons are actually super important. It's got that three with a triangle behind it. Uh, and so that is actually the symbol for a faction. And so there's different categories you can score points in, but if your opponent scores no points in a category, you actually double your point value in that category. So you need to be scoring at least one thing in every category, and then you also want to prevent your opponent from scoring points, but you probably aren't going to just like stop them from playing the game. Like you aren't just going to like win in that way. Now, technically you can. There's like assassination ways of doing it. Like uh, the, the wizard I'm choosing to play, and you represent a wizard in this game. So I, I'm playing as Gandalf, and he doesn't actually start in play. He starts in your deck, but if you play him, he's super good. Uh, you see that 10 hand there. That's his influence. That's basically how many points, uh, how many mind worth of character he can control in play, and it doesn't count against your total mind stat. So you start with 20, and if we'll pull Aragorn back up. He's got that 9 uh, on his mind, and that means he takes 9 of your 20 to just be in play. And then when you play Gandalf, he's got that 10 hand, which gives you a bonus 10 that you can use, basically. So, like, you know, if, if he were out... Uh, Aragorn could basically be uh, committed to him, and then Aragorn's nine doesn't even count against your your total. But you can technically win by eliminating your opponent's wizard. So if you go that route, it's possible. You can corrupt them, uh, you can defeat them, and I think that's feasible. But more times than not, and I'm curious to hear from people in chat about this, uh, is I doubt that's going to happen most of the time. So then it really becomes an, a thing about like the the bad guys are less trying to like you know send a bunch of cards to you to like annihilate you and more just trying to make your life miserable now there's a strategy called blocking as well where you can basically make it where they can't travel through a certain uh, area uh, and sometimes that's really devastating for certain decks apparently but you know i'm not obviously not trying to set that up in solo or even in just casual games um what i wait for you is this is the middle earth ccg it is super dated it is out of print 
uh, but you can still find it online. It's a game that I've been fascinated with since isolation. Uh, but the so what I'm looking to do with these decks that I built, right? So like as an example, uh, this is the one that I'll most frequently use, I think, which has got the, my little uh, tree symbol that I drew on there for wilderness. And so in here I've got wargs, I've got a river, I've got you know worn and famished a card, uh, and these all key uh, to this region. Um, and now technically, and, and it's true, you can imagine if you were deck building, uh, like if we pull up the wargs. They have three icons on them out of 11 uh, different regions that I, region types that I built. So the, well, let me see if I have, so I can properly reference them. Because there's technically uh, region symbols and site symbols. So, and there's a, I have the 11 or 12 that are built here. And so you can imagine if you're drawing, normally a hand size is eight, and we'll pull, um, you know, Moria up which is another piece of art that I love. But Moria has uh, three icons on it. So like when your opponent goes there, it, it's possible that like you don't have anything in your hand that would even be able to be played here. Uh, or maybe you do, but it's like not that great, so it's not worth your time. Uh, so basically what I need to simulate with these decks is like things that make sense to be played obviously need to make sense, but also there needed to be some way for cards not to happen. Because a lot of times when Steve and I are playing We'd play one card, even though we could maybe play two. Uh, or we would play none cards. Or there would be certain times when he goes somewhere and I have three or four big things that hit and he's got a three or four uh, you know, party, like a, a group. Uh, so sometimes it needs to be bad. So the way I'm simulating that is I have a deck for each region. And so when I move, like if I move from Rohan to uh, Minas Tirant, uh, we have the circle with the uh, uh, <laughs> tower with half black and white on it. Then in Anorian, we have the circle with the white tower in it. And then we technically have the, like, uh, just castle by itself symbol when I cross over into uh, Lebanon. Uh, so when I get to Minas Tirith. So I put Minas Tirith down, and it's got the logo on the top left for the castle. And then, you know, I can basically walk my way backward on my site path. And what I'm going to do is, let's say it was Aragorn and Arwen. They were going to Minas Tirith. I don't know why they want to do that. But they would definitely want to do that side note, especially in my deck. But let's say I go there. So my uh, threat value is two. So my opponent could technically play up to two cards. So what I'll do is I'll basically start with wherever I ended. And that's the last location. And because there's two, I'll go back one. And those last two icons, basically, so the wherever I'm going plus the last like region icon that I traveled through there, uh, those are the cards that I'm going to pull, starting with whatever I would have hit first. So like if I went through a forest to then get to a city, I would hit a forest or wilderness. Let me actually use the right names here. So like if I went to a wilderness to get to um, a freehold, as an example, uh, then I would, and I needed to draw two cards, I would do a forest first, then a freehold. But what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to roll a d20 for each card. So I'm going to start with the wilderness, I'm going to roll d20. And I, I basically want a 50-50 shot at this card happening or not. So before I even draw a card off of the Wilderness stack, I'll roll. And if it's a 1 to a 10, I'll get the bad card. And if it's an 11 to a 20, I won't get the bad card. And so what will happen is like, because sometimes you, know, you can move with up to four regions in between wherever you started and where you're wanting to end. So there could technically be six icons there. And then on top of that, if I had a party of five people, I could technically try to get five cards. And so what I'm wanting to really simulate here is that like a 50-50 shot on each of those, odds are I'm probably going to get two or three bad cards. Um, but it's possible I get five, which would be devastating. It's also possible I get none, uh, which sometimes your opponent draws and they just don't have any cards to play against you. Appreciate that. Uh, Mar Martini saying, listen to the Furious Finest today on my way to work. Nice interview. Jesse and I go way back. Uh, it's a great podcast. We ran a Crisis Protocol. I was happy to be on. So if you want to check that out, you can. It's the most recent episode. Thanks, Chris. Saying it's a really slick idea. The dice rolls and totally Miller CCG. Yeah, you just need some sort of variance because, like, I played it the first time after I built it because initially I was going to say every time two people travel they get two cards, and then very quickly it was like some impossible scenarios. But also like, just from comparing it to my game with Steven previously. It was obvious that like that's that's just too 
too much. Like it's it's you wouldn't consistently hit that many cards. So I'll be working through that, and that's that's the main thing. I'm also gonna have a five card hand instead of the traditional eight, and then I'm gonna draw just like normal. Like if we pull up Menace Terrence, you'll see on the bottom left of that it's got the two and the two. So the two is the value of cards I draw when I go here. And then the other, the two on the other side is the uh, number the enemy would draw when we go there. And so another thing I'm toying with, and we'll, I'm going to do the first session and see how I feel, is basically the using that number and subtracting it from my roll. So essentially, I right normally it's one to ten gets me a bad card, but if they're drawing three cards, then the odds are they're going to have more bad stuff to play. And so then it would actually subtract whatever my roll is. So if I hit a 12, right, 12 minus 3 is 9. So I'd still get the bad card. But that may be one step too much for me. We'll see once we actually get into it. 42 saying he really should use 2d6, though. Why do you think I should use 2d6? I got him. What makes that better? Curious. That's the bad die. I don't want that one. We have one that's like got this like melted side on it. You can't tell that it's a five. Yeah, Mark saying he likes that idea. Then dangerous places still scale, for sure. And then obviously, you know, the dangerous places have the. Okay, yeah, I, the game uses two d six, so I'll use the two d six. I'll definitely I'll use the two d six, but the same principle applies, right? So the middle value is uh, six and seven, so. Seven or better, I'm fine. Six or worse, I get the card. I don't know how it got melted. Bryce, do you know how this dice got melted? Bryce is the uh, uh, hero at home making these cards pop up, and these are all his dice that I think we're borrowing. He doesn't know. You can't tell. It's just got this, like, that's technically the five side. Who knows? Who knows? Okay, so quick rundown of my deck, and then we'll walk through it, and, you know, I'm going to be uh, shaking off some some rust myself. Uh because there's a lot. There's a lot going on in this game, but man, do I love it. <laughs> Jason says, "Twas smog. I agree. Had to, had to be smog. Bryce thought it was really funny, too. I saw the visible like laugh, like the bounce. Um, okay, so my deck uh, is, if you know me, going to be very unsurprising. Uh, I have Aragorn the second, and he has a couple things going on. He's worth three points just for starting the game. He takes nine mine, so uh, you, know, you have 20. That's a big character. He also provides three direct influence. That's that sim the black hand with a number in it. Uh, and that's going to make him really great. I'm pairing him with R1. And so when we pull R1 up, she's worth one point. She's got three mind, which means that Aragorn can just directly influence her. And that allows uh, her, you start with up to 20. But then literally, if they're in a party together from the very beginning, she's going to be under his influence. And she doesn't count against my total, which is really good. But back to Aragorn, he gets plus two direct influence against the Rangers of the North faction. So go ahead and pull up Rangers of the North faction. And this is what I, th I think is super uh, cool about the deck building in this game, uh, even though I'm failing at it, uh, which is not necessarily surprising given my youth and inexperience. Hold on, let me find it. Huh, disappeared. Anyways, so he's, he, he's good at influencing the Rangers of the North faction. Um, when you have a faction out, like I'm going to pull up one that I actually have in front of me, which is Rangers of Athelion. Uh, on the top left, you'll see it's a, got that upside down triangle with three on it. That's three points, and it's in the faction category, which is just worth knowing. It's unique. It says playable at Hineth Anuin. So you have to be there to play this card from your hand. And then if the influence check is greater than seven, uh, so you, you have to do it in normal rules of playing it, but you have to then pass an influence check of greater than seven. Uh, standard modification, Dunedains get plus one. So then we'll go ahead and pull up Faramir, who's another character I'll be playing. You can see him right here. He, he's two points, five mind, one direct influence. He is plus two direct influence against the Rangers of Athelion faction. It makes sense. He's a Ranger of Athelion. So, uh, and in fact, I just realized, oh, okay, it's not the same. I thought that art was literally just ripped from one card to the other. Um, so when you're making an influence check, he's going to get plus two against it. He's also Dunedain. So that means he'll get plus three total against it. He's really good at getting this. In the same way, Aragorn uh, is plus two influence against the Rangers of the North. So he's really good at getting that faction. Uh, and what you start figuring out is like it's all this like interconnected we weaving of on the deck building. And that's why it seems super complex at first. How could you balance all these things? But if you start just doing things that you know you want to do, like I knew I wanted to play Aragorn. So like Rangers of the North, which I'm just going to get out. I feel like that should potentially be in my deck. 
It might be a location thing. There were reasons I did everything that I did. Uh, but it's been a minute. There it is. That was so lucky. I have this big four-row box of cards, and I open it up to where roughly it could maybe be. And then there they were, Range of the North, playable at Bree. So let's look at our map here. Bree is way up here, I believe. Yep, next to the Shire. So that's not so bad, because I'm planning on starting in Rivendell, and you start mapping out this strategy as well. It's crazy. This game is fantastical and fantastic. Um, so technically, you know, that's not that far. Uh, but, you know, my kind of other things I know is one thing I really want to do in my deck is, um, well, two, two things I really want to do with the deck. First, I knew I wanted, I was playing Aragorn, I wanted to play Narsal. So you'll see Narsal, it's a three uh, point, uh, it's got the square box behind it, which means it's an item. It also provides plus one direct influence, which is uh, fine. It's a unique, it's a weapon, you get plus one to prowess and direct influence. So uh, prowess is basically your attack stat in this game. If we pull Aragorn back up, on the bottom left you'll see a six slash nine. Six is his prowess, nine is his body. Six is what he's gonna fight with. If he gets hit, he's gonna use a nine to test, which is really strong. Um, but I wanted to play Narsal. I also wanted to play Anduril, F the Flame of the West. And so obviously the shards of Narsal get melted and reforged into Anduril, Flame of the West. And the game, which you will come to learn if you're new, has the most thematic things in the entire world. There's a card called Reforging. So basically, to play Andril, the Flame of the West, uh, you literally have to play it on a Sage, and then at a location where information is playable, and then it says tap the Sage and the site. Sage makes a corruption check. Uh, keep Sage tapped until Andril is stored at a Haven. So you have to go get Andril, then you have to store it at a Haven, and then if we read Reforging, uh, sage only during the site phase and an untapped site where information is playable. You tap a sage in the site. Sage may not untap until reforging is stored at the haven, so it's working the same way. During the organization phase, you can tap a sage at a haven and discard a stored reforging to retrieve any minor or major items, weapon, armor, or shield from your discard pile. The item must be placed under the control of a character in the sage's company. But if we keep reading on Andoril, Flame of the West, remember I said it's like reading a book. Uh, it says... Uh, tap a sage's site. It's, they stay once you uh, once stored. You can discard a stored reforging. So if you go get reforging, you store it at a haven like uh, Lorien, and then you go get Andoril and you store it at a uh, haven. You can discard your stored copy of reforging and then place Andoril with Narsal. Uh, in addition to Narsal's effect, Andril gives its bearer plus four marshalling points, plus four prowess to a maximum of 11, plus one direct influence, and one more corruption point. So you'll see on uh, Andril, on the bottom right, you have that one. That's the corruption point. But basically, once you reforge it, you get to attach Andril to Narsal. And then Andril, be, instead of being one point, you see the top left, it's got the one in parentheses four, becomes a four-point card. And it then also gives Aragorn the, another direct influence, and it also gives an extra plus four prowess. So he goes from a six, Narsal gives plus one, Andoril gives plus four. So that literally gets him to an 11. And again, on the card itself, it says caps at 11, because they knew I would be here today, 25 plus years later, doing exactly this. So one of my key goals of my deck is to literally make this happen. Um, and what you'll see, even if I just started with Aragorn here, and these four cards, um, you start. the deck is already starting to be built. And basically, uh, the game ends in a couple ways typically, which is, it depends on how many decks you're playing. So one deck game means once someone exhausts, or once both players have gone through the entire deck once, the White Council is called, we see who's the most influential in Middle Earth, they win the game. If you do a two deck game, you go through your deck twice. That's apparently standard, that's a pretty normal amount. So what you're trying to do is score the most points you can by that, that time. And so in deck building, it's essentially, you kind of want to at least have one thing in every category that you can score. And you also definitely want things that can score you a lot of points without taking up necessarily a ton of slots. But the more points it is, the harder it's obviously to get. I feel like uh, chat's going wild. I just looked over and I haven't caught it in a minute. Just catching up here. Yep. Love it. 
Jonathan says, will you be using 20 points for characters? I know some solo rules I've seen use 15. So yeah, I'm going to go 20. Basically, again, I'm wanting this to be a half of a deck because eventually I'm going to pair it with uh, you know, bad guy cards based on what I find out when I'm exploring Middle Earth and what I like. And that way I can play it solo if I want or I can literally slam it together with the bad guy cards and go play against uh, someone or a group of someone. So uh, other things, and I think the point cards are super important to understand about your deck because that's going to inform your map strategy. So other things I knew I wanted in, you'll see Return of the King here. And this is also worth three points, and it's a permanent event. It's got that literal four-cornered diamond in the background. Um, Return of the King is unique. Aragorn the Second only, only playable on Minas Tirith, and only if Denethor is not in play. Aragorn the Second's direct influence is modified by plus three. Keep this card with Aragorn discarded if he leaves play. So I can't have Aragorn go away. If he has Narsal, Anduril, and Return of the King, Aragorn is a eight direct influence character, uh, which is is insane. But mainly, it's plus three points. Uh, another card I really love is called Choice of Luthien. One, this art kills me every time. It kills me. I love Choice of Luthien for every reason possible. Uh, it's one point. It gives plus two mind to whoever's using it, but it also plus two direct influence. And if we flip back really quick to Arwen. Uh, she's got three mind with zero direct influence, but she has plus seven direct influence only usable against Aragorn the second. So I basically have two paths here, because technically my opponent could be uh, mischievous and be playing Denethor, in which case Return of the King doesn't work. So I definitely, Reforging is probably a card that's going to go away, and so I, I won't have a permanent event um, point to score. So I need to be able to score one of these two. And I'm either going to score Choice of Luthien or Return of the King, or both, potentially. But if I score Return of the King, Aragorn has a ton of direct influence, I have characters in my deck like Imrahil or Glorfindel uh, who all of his direct influence can just make it them a, a ragtag team to go do whatever crazy thing I need them to do. Uh, or if I score a choice of Luthien and I attach this to Arwen, she can actually directly influence Aragorn and take his nine mind off the table for me, which is going to let me kind of widen my board quite a bit. Um, and then a few other things uh, that I included in the deck, some for uh, logistics, some for uh, theme. One of these is Shadow Facts. Obviously, this is Gandalf's horse, and it's an ally. And so there's very few allies in the game, honestly. That's, that's what I was surprised by. Uh, but when I was looking at various allies I could do, this was the most thematic to me, and I also liked the way it looked and what it did. So there you have it. And then on the recommendation of chat, I put in a few more weapons. Uh, had to have Glamdring. Again, uh, theme. This is just you know Gandalf's big sword. It's unique weapon, plus three prowess to a maximum of eight, or nine against orcs. And then I also put in a Sword of Gondolin, uh, which is warrior only. A ton, Faramir is a warrior, Aragorn's a warrior. There's tons of warriors in the deck, and it's a solid little card. And then I put in two factions. One I mentioned earlier was Rangers of Athelion, and then Knights of Dole Amroth. So that came together and this this oh, this, is, this is why it's so important to understand about the deck and the building and how I'm going to be playing which is once you realize this is kind of the goal you can start looking at the map and understanding this is a really nice map it's got a key over here and it basically tells you like let me find the, the icon for it information so anywhere with a black diamond on the map uh, I can actually pick up information I don't know if you guys can tell exactly what uh, these icons do but I see like weather top here and a weather top is a card, it'll probably pop up. But you'll notice on weather top the card, it says information is playable here. And so that's one place I can go. But you start looking, and basically you need to craft uh, you know, what you don't want to have to do, right? Is like, let's say I start up here in uh, Rivendell. And then I come all the way down to Minas Tirith so that I can play Return of the King. And then along the way, maybe I reforge and I get Anduril and I do all that. Uh, but then what you don't want to have to do is to score your ally or to score your, uh, you know, factions or your permanent events. You really don't want to have to, like, go way over here to Linden over on the coast, right? Like, that, that would be, that would take so much time. Just several turns where you're basically giving your opponent a chance to mess with you. Um, so you start figuring out basically where you want to be, uh, what you want to be doing, how it's going to work. And then from there, you can start putting together your short events and your minor items and the various things you're going to need to accomplish your goals. So I've done that. I have Aragorn and Faramir, who are both uh, rangers. And then Annalena and Arwen are both scouts and sages. So another thing you have to be careful about is your characters can get influenced by your opponent. They can also just take a hit and go away. 
And so I basically have two teams that have similar traits that they can do. Now, obviously, some of this stuff is Aragorn only, but they can basically help each other because uh, I have two sages and scouts and like all the cards that trigger. You know, as an example, I have block as a card, and it says warrior only. Warrior does not tap against a strike unless he is wounded by the strike. So this will work on Faramir or Aragorn, which is nice because I can play it in either party. Then I have something like, uh, where is it at? Concealment. It says scout only. Tap scout to cancel an attack against his company. So having Arwen and Annalena in the, the two companies means that's a really good card in this deck. Uh, and then even in the, the characters, so you can actually include extra characters in your deck. I'm looking at the traits and I'm looking at the, the mind cost. But you have someone like Imrahil, uh, who's a warrior and a Dunedain, so he's interesting. We also have Eowyn, who's a warrior and a scout, so she's actually a, an interesting combination of the two traits in both of my starting parties. Um, so if something happens, she can kind of function, and it's cool because it makes sense thematically that that's how she works. I also have Mablong, who's a warrior and a scout again, so I have two of those. He's also a Dunedain, which is good. And then I have Iorith, and she, again, she's hidden in Dunedain, and she's a sage. So sage is how I get the information out, it's how I get the Anduril out. And then finally I have Glorfindel, uh, and he's just a warrior sage. So those are all literally sharing two of the traits that I need to, to play all of my point cards. And then I obviously have some specific flair for Aragorn and Gandalf uh, explicitly. So that's my deck. Now I'm going to shuffle up, and we're going to get this party started and try this uh, solo mode for the very first time. So on top of your starting party, uh, which is, can be 20 points starting groups, uh, you also can have two minor items. So the items I chose to start with are Arwen has, uh, or Aragorn rather, has Elven Cloak, and it says tap Elven Cloak to cancel a strike against the bear. The strike must be keyed to Wilderness, and it may not be duplicated on a given character. So I'm going to be going through a lot of Wilderness. It's definitely the most common thing I'm doing, and the Elven Cloak is just going to let me sneak by uh, certain threats. Anesthesia Zach, such a Shadow Facts fanboy. I do love Shadow Facts. Uh, TL, yeah, I did get the Noble Steed. I just didn't end up putting it in. Um, it's on my short list of cards to work in. I like the idea of like dropping a Gandalf and then having him and whoever he's with on the Steeds uh, so that they can just like roam quickly wherever they need to get. Herman's saying Glorfindel's OP. I've heard Glorfindel's good. Uh, and so then with Faramir, I'm actually playing a card called Elfstone. I love the art on this card. It, it's great. Uh, but it gives him plus two influence used against an elf character or an elf faction. May not be duplicated on a given character. So you can only have one out. Uh, and with his one Faramir's one direct influence, the plus two is going to allow him to immediately influence or control Annalena um, directly. So that means her and Arwen's points aren't going to count against me. So then my total starting, technically I'm starting with 20. It's actually, yeah, it's 20 on the, on the dot. But literally from the start, uh, those two threes are going to go away. So I have six points that I can use to play other characters. Uh, you don't start out with a wizard. Jonathan, it's shuffled into your deck. I was just forgetting to shuffle it. So thanks, stream, for catching me on that. Bryce, we doing all right? All right, thumbs up. And again, I'm going to use this green because uh, it matches uh, uh, Faramir. I'm going to start in Rivendell with both, and the red is going to be Aragorn. These are my starting characters. I'm going to put them so you can see them. I'm going to put the bad guy stuff over here. That way you can check it out. Matt, that's so funny. A wizard is never late. He shuffles into the deck precisely when he intends to. Any other questions before I dive in? Now's a good time. I'll, uh, I'll get real focused once I start diving in. That's what the first time there was a, a stream where we were playing champions early on against Rhino, and Steven had to leave, and I had never done a solo stream like that before. And I was just playing the game and just like super locked in and just like jamming it out. And uh, I went back and watched it later and it was like, oh, I could have like, I don't know, breathed occasionally. That's awesome, Parker. Saying opening Gloomhaven while I'm watching the stream, loving it. 
Let us know what you think about Gloomhaven once you played it. Lion Day saying, excited to see some solo play. Well, I'm excited to see if it works. Could be a just <laughs> a fail, <laughs> which would be funny. That's how you learn. You can't be afraid to fall on your face. All right. Let me turn to my handy dandy compendium. Nah, I'll just pull it over here. Okay, so uh, first thing I'm gonna do is draw five. Again, I'm doing a five hand size instead of eight, the typical eight. My objective here is to score as many points as I can. Um, your eye, Bryce? You seem confused. And we'll uh, get to it. So first thing is we get to the turn structure is the untap phase. Technically, I haven't tapped anything, so of course I can't untap anything. Then we get to the organization phase. And during the organization phase, you can play one character uh, or your wizard if you have it. I did draw Gandalf, so now I'm going to have to make a choice. I may as well play him. You know what I mean? Uh, Prince saying, do you have location-specific baddies in the deck, like Shaylob? I do have location-specific uh, things in the deck. Um, yeah, so basically the, there's a few things, too, where it's like, like the Nazgul are in here, but they can always be played as permanent events. So I have some Nazgul in places you wouldn't necessarily expect them uh, because they just randomly show up and they become a permanent event. And it's pretty cool because like, I, I basically balanced. Um, there's like all sorts of different sub uh, strategies going on with like orcs and trolls and spiders and all this kind of Nazgul and uh, assassins and stuff. So like, I wanted it where if you're not just, basically, if you just stayed in the forest, right? Like you'd have to go through three or four forests for those cards to back to back hit each other. Uh, and so there's there's definitely some synergies b between them all, and if this ends up panning out, I'll, I'll list whatever whatever I end up having. Uh, but there are certainly some region specific uh, bad guys. I remember saying Gandalf first turn is super nice. Yeah, I agree. So I'm gonna go and play Gandalf. Uh, Gandalf has ten uh, direct influence, which is great, uh, and he just provides that that ten for me to use. All of his corruption checks are modified by plus one, and he can tap to test a gold ring. Uh, and I'm going to play him. And then after that, a handful of other things you can do during the organization phase. You can reorganize any companies that are at the same location. So my companies here are at the same location, but I'll keep them in this uh, arrangement. And then you can also decide where, this is where you decide where to move each company by putting new locations face down next to each. Obviously, I'm not planning this anyone, so it doesn't need to be face down. We'll get back to that in a second. You can also technically pass items from one character to another. The passing character has to make a corruption check, though. So we'll get to corruption checks if we get to them. And then you can also store items at Havens during this phase. Of course, I don't have any items to store yet. Then we get to the long event phase. And so there's cards that are long events. Let me see if I have any in my hand. I don't. But you basically discard any of your long events that are currently in play, and you can play a new one. And that's going to stay in play until you get back around to your long event phase. So this is where you might play stuff that uh, you know, will help you through the turn uh, or create some kind of different condition for the next turn of the game. Then we get to the site phase. Now each company at the new site, uh, one by one, you reveal where they're going and what they're doing. So let's see if I got anything interesting. So looking at my hand, uh, can you see this? I'll just put it over here. I can display it because I don't have any opponents. The only playable card I got was Sword of Gondolin. So I want to get that on a character. Ideally, actually, I want to get this on um, Faramir because uh, I'm planning on doing Narsal and whatnot on Aragorn, and they don't both need swords. Plus, I have Gandalf as backup here. I also got a Stealth, uh, which is you can tap a scout at the end of the organization phase, uh, only if the scout's company is less, size less than three. No creature hazards can be played on that company this turn. That's just a protection uh, piece. Also got dodge. Target character doesn't tap against a strike. Uh, so that's where you can basically block without having to exhaust. Then I got healing herbs. So that's a minor item. Uh, when you would play a major item or anything else, really, 
You can always exhaust an extra character to play a minor item, which we'll probably cover in a minute, but that would be nice to get, get into play. It says the bear can tap and discard this item to heal a character in the company. So uh, basically you tap, and then if you get hit or whatever past that point, you actually become wounded, which is upside down. Uh, and then if you're at a haven, you can recover uh, one phase. And if you're tapped right at this phase, no matter where you're at, you can untap. But if you're wounded, you don't switch literally until you get to a haven, which is how you heal. So healing herbs can be super powerful. So let's see. I think what I want to do is not risk. Uh, Sword of Gaunt is a major item. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look where I can play major items. And if we look over on the key, it's any of the squares that are half filled. So the nearest place, uh, Moria, don't think I'm going to be going there anytime soon. Mount Graham, I can play one at Mount Graham, and that's one region away, so that's not that risky. Um, where else can I play that's in reach? So again, when you're moving, these regions are marked with these red borders, and so you can have four regions in between where you're starting and where you're ending. The Ruined Signal Tower, uh, but it's got that nasty... Nasty uh, runes and layers. That's where all the, the baddest stuff comes out. Um, now, interestingly, right, because I have this stealth, I could literally tap a scout. So, like, Annalena could tap at the end of this phase, and then I literally can't get minions when I'm going to that place. So that's not a bad time to do it. When you also... Uh, we'll just cover it when I get there. I'm trying to explain too much all at once. I'm just looking... So it'll be one, two, three. Okay, let's try it. Uh, I'm going to move Faramir, and I'll find my location, my deck, to the Ruined Signal Tower. So I'm going to go ahead and get that out. Now, normally when you were playing like a full game, I would take this location and put it face down here uh, next to this party. And uh, Or you either put a new location here, or you say that you're going to a location that's already in play. And that could be this location. It could also be a location that is already revealed somewhere. Um, and then I'm actually going to hang tight uh, with Aragorn and Gandalf and crew because I don't have anything I want to play with them, and I don't want to waste my movements going the wrong direction. I ultimately want to come down here, but I can get there fairly uh, quickly. Forty-two saying, would it be possible to move the enhanced pop-up card view to the top of the window? It always blocks the view of the companies in the lower left. Uh, it would be, I don't think it's possible right now. We have it set up for different, for co cooperative and competitive games, but that's definitely something we can look at in the future. Um, so what I'm going to do is I want to basically play this item somewhere that I'm not going to revisit, actually. So I'm going to rethink my strategy. Instead of the ruined signal tower, let me put it back. I'm going to keep these in alphabetical order as best I can. I'm actually going to go to Mount Graham because it's just one, uh, one region up. So let me find Mount Graham. There it is. And then Aragorn and Gandalf and Armour are just going to hang out at Rivendell. So uh, that is the... Let me scroll back and make sure I'm doing this right. Organization phase. And then I'm going to play Stealth. And it says Scout only. Tap a scout to play at the end of the organization phase. Only if the scout's company size is three or less. So I'll tap Annalena. And it says, no creature hazards may be played on the company this turn. So I can't get creatures. And then I'm going to go ahead and I'm not moving them. So I'm going to go ahead and go to the, uh, the resolution of this, so to speak. Movement phase. For each company, reveal their new site card. Uh, and they move to that location on the board. If, the movie, if moving to a non-haven, draw cards based on the site you're moving to. So on... Mount Graham, you'll see there's a three on the other side and a two on my side. So I'll get to draw two. Now that's interesting. Now we got some stuff going on. And then there's a three on the other side. So that's why I, I kind of like a three out of 12 is a lot, though. Um, but like, you know, if I was playing against an opponent, they would get to draw three here, which is a ton. Let's go ahead and move up to Mount Graham. And that's where, like, you know, basically I could take it where, like, that's a negative modifier on my roll here to see if I get the bad card. So I'm just going to go ahead and fly with that, and we'll see how it feels. Herman's saying, pro tip, that companies that can move should move so you don't waste turns. I mean, that's fair. I mean, because they both get a draw, 
when I'm, I'm going, so that's literally four cards that I'm going to get to go through, and moving this group first means that I would draw those two first, which will give me a better chance with them. So just... Uh, uh, I guess, here's another question for you. If I'm already in a location, so like when you move like Mount Graham, when I go here, is we get to the hazard phase, opponent gets to do stuff, then I get to decide whether I enter or not, and entering is how you actually uh, play um, items and whatnot. So if I go somewhere and I don't enter, um, can I then choose to enter it the next phase, like the next turn? Um, and if I do enter it, what happens? Do I, I don't think I have a sight path anymore or a hazard phase, right? How does that, how does that work? Herman's saying, yes, I, I believe I can. I can enter. So what do I have to do to be able to enter at that point? You get a hazard phase, but I assume they're just keyed to that lo specific location. Okay, cool. So in that case, I'm going to go ahead and move uh, Aragorn and R1 and Gandalf somewhere I can play information, because th those are the most important cards in my deck, which is a diamond. Uh, well, Dimril Dale is real close, and I can play. Um, let's see, where else is there? I could technically go... So Weathertop, that sounds like a Nazgul if I've ever seen one. Let's just, uh, let's go to Dimmerald Dell. Do, do, do. That's where they're going. That art's great. So good. Okay, so uh, Faramir started in uh, Rudar, which is a forest, and we ended up in Angmar. At, at Mount Graham. And if you look at Mount Graham uh, here, it's got the matching thing on the map, which is the like tower that's half full. So I got a tower that's half full and a forest. So I'm going to go ahead and grab those decks. And we're going to have our first. I almost lost a whole deck of cards there off the top of the table. These sleeves are like slick. So I'm going to leave my little icon here and shuffle up. Appreciate that. I get it. So if you move to a site and then don't enter it, you just hang out. Then the next round, you don't have a movement path, but you can your opponent could still key things in the hazard phase to your site. And then when you choose to enter a location, that'll be its, its own thing we'll get to in a second. OK. And then we'll get that forest ready. I assume that's actually going to be the thing that I like use the most. that my deck wants to be in the forest. Jonathan is saying, I tried to do something similar with the multiple decks, but I don't have enough cards yet, unfortunately. You're talking about building the decks like I built? I think I have like one box of wizards, roughly, and one box of uh, dragons, and I opened the one last time, or some of the one last time, that didn't really isn't really compatible. It's the Fallen Wizard set, White Hand, I think. OK, so again, the way I'm doing it is I have two people in my party. And the first place I would have hit is the forest. The second place I would have hit is the, let me get these names correct, the shadow holds. So starting with the forest, I'm going to roll a d6. And I'm going to use the card draw on the other location as a modifier. So seven or better, I don't get a card. It's good for me. Six or lower, I do get a card. So I'm going to go ahead and roll. And then I got a nine. So 9 with that 3 modifier is still 6, so I get the first bad card. And it's a wargs. So I played wherever it's at. Uh, stealth. I can't get creatures, so I'm just going to act like that got discarded. Then we get to Mount Graham. Again, a minus 3. So I need a 10 or a better to avoid a card, which is a 4. Uh, so I'll get the card, and we'll see what it is. Greed. 
playable on a site. Until the end of the turn, each non-Hobbit, non-Wizard character at the site must make a corruption check each time an item is played at the site. The character playing an item need not make a corruption check. So, I don't have to make a corruption check if the person playing the item is, for the person playing the item. Uh, but each other character does. So if I play an item on Faramir, Annalene is going to have to make a corruption check. When a character makes one of these corruption checks, if it is modified by it is modified by subtracting the corruption points that the item would normally give the character if he controlled the item, cannot be duplicated on a given site. So let me read that one more time to make sure I got it. Greed, playable on a site, so it's going to go on Mount Graham. Until the end of the turn, each non-Hobbit, non-Wizard at a site must make a corruption check each time an item is played. A character playing an item need not make a corruption check. When a character makes one of these corruption checks, it is modified by subtracting. Okay, so whatever item I'm playing, like Sword of Gondolin, uh, has that bottom right corner is a 2. So literally, it's going to modify any corruption checks if I end up deciding to play it, um, which is pretty cool. So uh, we get here. We, had no, we obviously avoided the enemies, and I'll keep walking it down. Uh, movement phase, reveal the site card. Opponent plays hazards, so we did the hazards. Once all hazards are resolved, remove previous site, so it wasn't in play. Uh, both players draw back to eight, and we're discard down. So technically I have five. I could, uh, I would discard down, but I just gotta keep my hand. Then we get to the site phase. Now each company is at their new site, one by one in the order of my choice. Oh, now they moved, here's this. And before I resolve that, I actually go over here and resolve this one. So uh, they're gonna move to Dimmerdale, and let me just make sure. Yep, and I ended up drawing information, which is pretty sweet. So they're gonna go from forest into forest into Dimmerdale. Uh, so I'm gonna grab Dimmerdale, it's a Ruins and Lair, uh, which I already have out, and a forest. So two cards. First is a forest, uh, and Dimmerdale is only a one threat. So now my modifier is only a minus one. So I got a nine, which is going to be eight, which is higher than my, sev my seven or better. So I'm not going to draw a forest card. And then now I'll get the Ruins and Lairs. Uh, is that what it is, Ruins and Lairs? It is. I went to a Ruins and Lairs. Uh, 12, so I don't get that bad card either. And again, that's just symbolic of my opponent not having any cards. Uh, they played their cards here. They didn't get a play in here, but they could have just as easily played two, uh, which you know could be good, bad, or ugly for me. Uh, and then when I hit there, let me see when that happens, actually. Reveal a new site, move. Uh, we draw our cards, so technically I would get to draw one more card, and I got an Emerald Hill. Uh, then they didn't play anything. Then, now we're actually going to get to the site phase. So each company is at their new site, one by one, and in the order of my choice, I can decide to enter the site. When they enter the site, a couple things happen. Auto attacks trigger. Uh, if you defeat auto attacks, you can tap uh, any character at the location to play a specified item. So as an example, if we look at Dimmerdale, it's got an automatic attack orc, one strike with six prowess. So if I defeat that strike, then I can play an item. And then remember, if I play an item, like if Aragorn wants to play an item, he has to tap to do it. And if I play an item, as specified, I actually tap the location, which we'll get to in a second. But then I can also tap another character to play a minor item. Uh, when I move from here, if it's tapped, that location is going to go into a discard pile, and I'm not going to be able to revisit that location um, until my deck reshuffles. Chat, you guys are the best. Help Matt, help Matt Reznor out here. I love seeing that happen. People asking questions and whatnot. If you have questions, please please let me know. Uh, happy to take some time to answer them, uh, especially if it pertains to Middle Earth CCG. But you know, I'll I'll feel whatever questions make sense. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and resolve. Oh, I have to discard down. Actually, I want these. I'm gonna get rid of the dodge. So basically, I can play Emra Hill next uh, turn. Technically, I'd have to go to Dull Amroth. Or, where's Dull Amroth? Do people know? Someone, oh, it's way down here. So I can play him at a Haven, which will be the goal. Because um, you can basically play an ally. If we pull up Emra Hill, on the bottom right you see his home site, Dull Amroth. So you can play him at Dull Amroth or at a Haven. But once your wizard's in play, uh, you actually 
to play him at a haven, your wizard has to be there. Basically, he's recruiting him. You can't act like your wizard's off doing a recruitment. So, uh, let's... I got rid of the dodge, even though that's a really good card. But I can basically play the sword and the healing herbs. Uh, and then I'll, I'll also probably be playing reforging. Um, and then I did get rangers of Athelion. They're playable at Hineth, Hineth Anuin, which is over here. So I'm going to want to make that happen. But Faramir's way up north now. So I got problems. Kind of problems. We'll eventually get there. Uh, let's go here first because it'll be more complicated. Uh, actually, let's go here first because it's less complicated. So Dimmerald Dale, uh, I'm going to go ahead and enter. So I face an automatic attack, uh, one strike with six prowess. And I'll run down how an attack works. Let me find it real quick. All right, combat. So there's one strike, and the defender gets to choose where that strike is going to go, unless uh, the attack says otherwise. Um, so I have one strike, and my best character... I'm going to defend it with Aragorn because I want to play uh, Reforging ultimately is what I'm looking to get into play and some Healing Herbs. So I want to, is Gandalf? It definitely has to be a Sage, right? So I'll probably end up putting uh, Reforging on R1 because it's going to keep her tapped until I get back to a Haven. And then I'll put the healing herbs on Gandalf um, so that he doesn't exhaust, assuming I get there. So the orc is going to do a strike. And here's how that works. The defender chooses. I'm going to put the strike on Aragorn. Uh, any strikes that remain after untapped characters are assigned strikes. So like if there are five strikes, I would do one, two, three, and then there's two left. Uh, the enemy would actually get to choose uh, those as like additional modifiers. Oh, there it is. <laughs> the finish is where to assign strikes. Must assign evenly and one per character. Can't assign to tapped characters. So I have three untapped. But if they were all tapped, my opponent would actually get to pick where they go. Once they all have even number of strikes, one each, uh, the extra strikes can be applied as extra minus ones to my uh, defense stats. Untapped characters not targeted by hits can tap to add a prowess. So technically I could tap these guys to give, make Aragorn stronger. They'll cheer them on. Unassigned strikes can now be applied to any given strike for a minus one. I make a roll of a 2d6. And if I roll, my roll plus my prowess is less than the attack. So it's a six. My prowess is a six. It's impossible for my roll to be less at this point. Uh, then I get hit. I'm wounded, which means you would flip upside down. Uh, and you would only be able to unflip once you got to a haven. Or if you had someone that healed you. Uh, then you're wounded. Uh, if you're wounded, then you make a body check, which is that second stat. So we pull up Aragorn. The six is his prowess. The nine is his body. Um, and we would get to the body check in a little bit. But if you fail the body check, you're actually eliminated. Uh, if your roll plus your prowess is, is less than the attack, you're wounded. If you tie, uh, if you actually succeed on the attack and it was like an enemy, you would score it. But if it's on the location, you just you enter it. Uh, let's see. Yeah. So the other thing is, I would actually get minus three prowess if I don't tap to do this block. So technically, I could stay standing, and I'm a three. I'm rolling two dice, and I need three total, so only snake eyes would fail me. But I don't need Aragorn to be untapped right now, so I'm going to go ahead and tap Aragorn. He's at a six. I need a six or better total. I end up with a 15, so I succeed against that strike, and now I've officially entered this site. Now that I'm there, I will do as I said, so I will exhaust R1 and this site to play information. It says on uh, Dimmerald Dale, playable information. I'm going to play Reforging. Sage only during the site phase at an untapped site where information is playable. Tap the Sage in the site. Sage may not untap until Reforging is stored at a haven. During my organization phase, I can tap a Sage at a haven and discard a, di a stored Reforging to retrieve any minor or major weapon, armor, or shield from the discard pile. The item must be placed under the control of a character in the Sage's company. Now, I'm not going to do that. That's not why I'm doing it. I'm also going to tap uh, Gandalf to play Healing Herbs because any you can tap an extra character to play a minor item at the same location as somewhere you're playing an item. Ryan's saying, uh, quick correction here. In the standard rules, once your wizard is in play, you have to bring new characters into play where your wizard is unless you bring them in with a character's direct influence. So what do you mean by direct influence? 
So like, can like a character's direct influence could basically influence uh, Imra Hill if they were at Dol Amra. So like. Faramir, if he had enough, or Aragorn could go to Dol Amroth and then, like, influence Emrahil. Yeah, Herman, Arwen learning some smithing. Got you there. Yeah, the Black Hand, direct influence. Okay, so basically you could still play a character not where your wizard's at as long as you can play them as complete direct influence under a character. At their home site. Still at their home site? Waiting for confirmation before I get to a position where I can't reverse it. Okay, cool. Thanks, Smeagol. Okay, so that's the resolution of that. Uh, let me make sure I'm not missing anything. Also in a haven, they can do direct influence. Okay, it makes sense. Okay, cool. So let's go to Faramir's side. Um, this is an automatic uh, tax, orcs, three strikes with six prowess. So, like, that's fishy. We think that's fishy. You know what I mean? Because if I play greed, she, Annalene is going to have to make a corruption check at minus two. I don't like that. And also, this is just a horrible location to go to. I learned my lesson. Uh, Mount Graham is uh, tough, unless you have a, a big party. I guess technically I could have flipped, dropped it, and reversed it and sent uh, Aragorn and Gandalf up, up north. But that's a lot. Mount Graham is a three card draw and it's also uh, three strikes to get in. Because it's six prowess, so like technically it'd be a strike strike. She's already tapped. So I think she gets a minus one or I think it's a minus. It's minus three if you don't tap. If you're already tapped, I think it's minus two. Or it's minus one, and then if you're wounded, it's minus two. Not like going into a strike. So she'd be at a minus one, which is a two prowess to six. I would have to get a four. And then Faramir. If he blocks the first one, would pass. He would definitely pass, but then they're both tapped. So if he doesn't block, he's at a two. I'd, need, I'd, I'd have a four out of 12 twice to like lose a character. Minus one of tap, minus three if you want to stay standing. If you don't tap. But if you're already tapped, it's minus one. Whew. All right, well, they're just going to get face checked at Mount Graham, and they're going to hang out. So greed, I assume, is still attached. Then we get to the end phase. Um, so, into my turn, active player can discard a card and then draws back up. So, I will keep my cards. I like them, but I will draw back up. There's another dodge and a vanishment. This is new. I also, this art, this is the art that's on the box of the uh, um, challenge decks. Like, it's the box that came in. And I love this art. That, that is so good. Gandalf the Witch King, the match. We all wanted to see and never got to. Uh, before I, I continue on, does all this make sense? How's everyone doing? Uh, any any uh, thoughts so far on, on what you're seeing, especially for people that have been playing the game? I feel like right now it, it feels a lot like I, the full game did, uh, where I'm hitting some bad cards, I'm not hitting sometimes. Uh, being able to cancel the enemies was nice here, and then I just didn't hit any here, but that's going to come back to haunt me, I know it. And then technically, uh, I actually just realized something that I did wrong in my own uh, rules. So I had three characters here, so I should have actually made three checks to see if a bad uh, something came out. So I need a seven on that third one. Uh, I'm not going to go back and do it because there's too many things that have happened since then. Jason says Gandalf is no-no. Ryan says, I like what's going on so far. Your modification specifically for the hazard rules. Cool. Derek's saying, uh, yeah, I definitely think this is a reasonable way to simulate a game for solo players, for sure. Yeah, and again, you know, like, I think you could ratchet up the difficulty or notch it down however you wanted. You could also set it up where it feels more like a certain scenario, like destroying the one ring or something. Um, but as a way to just kind of get a deck on the table and see what's functioning and kind of, you know, like, I feel like there's so many little things that you learn. Like, as an example, uh, the idea of going to Mount Graham to, to get a major item is, like, I learned very quickly. I'm not going to probably do that in a, a full-on game. Uh, so you can learn a lot of those little things quickly without having to, like, you know, use up the one or two times you're going to get to play this uh, when you get together with someone. 
Okay, uh, so the beginning of the turn, we'll loop back around. Remember, we started earlier with the untap phase. So everything gets to untap, besides our one, because she's busy re learning how to reforge. Uh, that site also doesn't untap. And then we go to the organization phase. So I can play a character if I want. Uh, technically, Dol Amrith Imrahil could get played, but I am nowhere near that right now. Um, that's very good to know. Jason says, it's interesting to think about how to make a great solid here game. Yeah, it's definitely, uh, I think part of what makes this game easier to do that way is that, like, you really just need some random spice to come at you from the bad guys. Uh, you, it, you know, the, the way when we were playing, it's like, I'm sure there are people that are really good at playing the bad guys in this game, but I never felt like it was as orchestrated as, like, the Lord of the Rings TCG. So uh, it, it seems like it's pretty achievable here. All right, so untap, uh, organization phase. Uh, I can play a character. I'm not going to do that. I can reorganize companies at the same location. It's not going to do that. I can decide. I'm deciding where to move each uh, group. So my uh, Aragorn, Arwen, Gandalf party, I know exactly where they're going, which is Lorien. It's literally right next to them. And it's a haven, which is where I need to get that reforging. So I'm just going to put it there, because that's where they're going to go next. And then Faramir and co. Let's see. I still want to get that Sword of Gondolin going. But you know, I assume they're not going to make it easy for me to play major items. Spoiler alert. But you know, like the Barrow Downs, that's a major item place. So let's let's try it. I'm going to go Barrow. I'm going to look at Barrow Downs and see how awful it is. OK, that's, that's way better. Um, so I'll just go ahead and put Barrow Downs here. I also like the undead vibes. And then I'll, let me make sure there's nothing else I want to do in the organization phase. Pass items, not going to do that. Store items, I want to do that in a little bit. Long event phase, no long, long events. Then we get to the movement phase. One at a time, each company uh, reveals their site card and moves to the location on the board. If moving to a non-haven, et cetera, on the card draw. OK. So let's go uh, Aragorn and Gandalf first. They're going to move one space over to um, uh, Lorien, which uh, Lorien is a haven. But the uh, I'm coming from here, which is going to be, I'm not going to key the site to that. Looks like Redhorn Gate is a forest as well. But the, the icon on this region is uh, the like half filled in. It's this blue deck. Um, I gotta learn these icon names. The shadow holds. So technically, I'm going shadow holds, and then the region here where uh, Lorien is at is a forest. So I believe because I'm going to Lorien, it would be shadow holds, forest, haven would be the three types. Technically, I have three characters, so I'm gonna do shadow holds, forest, forest. Greed's apparently discarded, by the way. Thank you for catching me on that. Ryan, are you saying I'm right in that it's uh, icon name, icon name, shadow holds, forest, forest? So, one, boom, boom. Shadow holds, forest, forest. I'm going to Lorien. It's got a two card draw. So, technically, when I'm rolling the dice, right, uh, I'm going to get minus two. So, I need nine or better. Cool. Shadowland Forest Haven. Got it. Site pathing. So when I move, let me see the order. What up, Maurice? Is the game design similar to anything you've played? I just got here. I think the map and the movement and the, the way you're exploring and, and gathering things, I, I don't know that I've played a, a game that has this, this much of an open world vibe. Honestly, I can't think of anything that's super similar to this. It's got certain elements that Lord of the Rings TCG has the like half good cards, half bad cards. Um, you have the group of people traveling, but it's it's a lot more linear. 
I got you, Herman. If you have any questions, Maurice, let me know. I linked, uh, I'll link to it again here, uh, which is the basics, rundowns of the rules and the, the structures and stuff and how it works. Smeagol says, side path from Dimmel Dale to Lorient should be Wilderness, Wilderness, Haven. Oh, yeah, that's right. So I thought the Redhorn Gate here was next to the forest, but the arrow's pointing down into Dimmel Dale. So it's forest, forest, Haven. And I have three people. So the hazard limit's uh, three. So I'm going to get three cards. The draw on Lorient is two. So basically the way I'm doing it is solo. If I get six or worse, I get the card. Seven or better, I, I don't get the card. It's a draw of two, so that's going to modify me where I need an eight or better. No, nine or better. Makes sense, Smeagol. OK, so uh, when do I draw? We draw in beforehand. So first thing I'll do is I'll draw two, because that's what it says. And I got Return of the King. Looks like I'm going to be making my way to Menace Terran with my friends. And I also got a block. So I have a dodge, which is going to let me not tap against a strike, and I won't get the negative modifier, of course. I have block, which means a warrior is not going to tap. And then I also have vanishment, which my wizard can play to cancel an attack against the wizard's company. And then the wizard is going to make a corruption check if I play that card. So I have some, some nice protection here. I'm going to go ahead and roll. We got all wilderness, three potential cards. Uh, I got a minus two, so I need a nine or better to avoid the cards. I failed, so I get the first card. I'm just going to do all three to see how bad this is going to get. I guess technically I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. I need to just track how many rolls I've made. Uh, I wouldn't know if my opponent had more cards. They're just playing one at a time. So we'll go ahead and face the first one. We got the brig Brigands. It's uh, one point if I can defeat it. It's a min. It's two strikes. If any strike of brigand Brigands wounds a character, I want to say Brigands, Brigands, wounds a character, the company must immediately discard an item of the defender's choice. So, it's got an 8 attack. How do I want to do it? I'll probably tap my Elven Cloak. I have an Elven Cloak on Aragorn. It says, uh, tap Elven Cloak to cancel a strike against Bearer. A strike must be keyed to wilderness, may not be duplicated on a given character. So I'll definitely deal my first one there. It's, it's got two strikes, so it's going to be Aragorn and Gandalf. Aragorn can cancel one. And then, now here's a question. If I cancel both attacks, does that count as defeating it, or does that just discard it? Discarded. So I actually, I have to beat both strikes. If I cancel either of them, I don't score it. Or if I beat one of them and cancel the other, would that count? I'm trying to be sneaky here. So like, technically on the point scoring, if you look at the, the brigands, they have that one in the corner. And when you defeat enemies, you score them. So part of the, the downside of playing enemies against your opponent is actually it can let them score points. OK, you have to beat them all to score the points. And again, if you don't score in a category your opponent scores in, they get double. So if they defeat an enemy and you just don't ever defeat an enemy, then that's really bad. Oh, man. So now I have to decide. So like. Another option is I could actually just try to beat this guy because he's at an 8, Gandalf's at a 6, Aragorn's at a 6, even Snake Eyes gets me there. And I have dodge and block, so I can literally block both of these without having to exhaust. Um, so I like that. So first strike, here's what I'll do. I'll use block with Aragorn. Uh, Warrior does not tap against the strike unless he's wounded by the strike. He's at a 6 to the 8, so I'll roll. Got it. Beat the first strike. Second strike's against Gandalf, and I'll play a dodge. Target character does not tap against one strike unless he is wounded by the strike, uh, etc. Gandalf's a six. I need better than or at least a two, which I got three, barely. Uh, so I actually defeat the brigands, and so I'll score that card. I'll just put it here. Uh, I'll need that key, actually. Where do I want to put these things? 
can this be seen? Yeah, we'll put the scored enemies over here. And then I'll save the cloak for a potentially worse enemy like a troll, because I've heard rumors there's trolls in these forests. All right, so the second uh, card that I get to roll, I need a nine or better to not get the second card. I got a five, so I'll get the card. It's going to be bad. Long winter. Environment. Each moving company that has at least two wilderness in its sight path must... Oh, no, that's me. Must return to its site of origin unless it contains a ranger. That's also me. Additionally, if Doors of Night is in play, each non-haven site in play with at least two wilderness in its sight path is tapped. Cannot be duplicated. So Long Winter doesn't do anything because I have a ranger. That's going to be a pretty dead card against me most of the time. But that happens. Like when you're playing against an opponent um, and that's with a card in your hand, you might play it just to get out of your hand. Herman saying rangers for the win. Yeah, they're good. I like rangers. Uh, and then I got a 10. So I'll actually avoid the third card. And that'll be that phase here. They'll stop. They're officially going to make it to Lorraine. And then... Uh, Faramir and Annalena are going from Mount Graham to the Barrow Downs. So I gotta find where those are again. They were not far. Okay, cool. So I go from Angmar to Rud Rudar to Cardolan, all the way to the Barrow Downs. So that's gonna be in my sight path is technically it's the only the last two that really matter. So it's gonna be the matching icon, which is runes and layers. And so there's the way I'm doing it, if you're just now hopping on. Uh, is I have two characters. The hazard limit is minimum of two, and then you, if, you know, three characters means my hazard limit would be three. Four characters is four, and so on. And so, because it's two, I'm going to take the last two, which is the site I'm at, and then the pre, the basically the previous region in my site path. Um, so the region in this case is going to be forest. So I've got uh, ruins and layers, and then forest. And then Barrow Downs, when I'm traveling, it has the two and the one. So the two is the modifier I'm going to apply to the roll to see how I draw the card. And the one is how many cards I get to draw. Choice of Luthien, I'm getting all my point cards. That's not, not what the doctor ordered. Um, so the first thing I'm going to try is the Wilderness. And I get a roll. And it's going to be minus two. And I'm trying to get a seven or better. So I need a nine. Got a six, so I will get the first card, which is going to be a Wilderness. And this is Searching Eye. Cancel any card requiring Scout skill before it is resolved, or cancel any ongoing effect of a card that required Scout skill to play. If this card is played as an on-guard card, it can be revealed during opponent's sight phase to cancel a card requiring a Scout skill. So technically, as an example, earlier I played Stealth, uh, and that let me tap a Scout to basically prevent me from getting enemies. So if Searching Eye flipped, after I played that, it would cancel. And that's that's part of why that card is in there. Because um, I knew I would be playing scouts. And then the, the other one is the Ruins and Layers uh, of the Barrow Downs. So I'm going to roll. And again, I need a 9 to avoid this card. And I got a 10. So I avoid that card. And I make it. So Mount Graham was not tapped. It'll actually go back into the deck of, of revisitable locations. And you can imagine that I won't be going back. I did not avoid my, uh, enjoy my trip. One star. Won't do again. Jonathan, that's uh, glad to hear you saying that. It says the dice system seems to be working out pretty good for drawing cards. Your opponent doesn't always play a card every time, or as many as they can. <laughs> Anesthesia Cat says, I laugh too loud and people are starting to look at me at work. Stop being funny. Well, I'll try my hardest. Not exactly trying to be in super funny. Uh, <laughs> let's keep going. So they both made it to the locations. Uh, next, we're going to get to the site phase. I can choose to enter. Lorien uh, doesn't have any automatic attacks because I'm at a haven. Um, next turn is when I'll be able to store, so that'll be good. And let me read Reforging to make sure I'm doing that right. Okay. <laughs> Luke G, Mount Graham, 0 out of 10. Do not recommend. Agreed. Nathan saying, just popped in. This is a co-op Lord of the Rings game. How many players? So it's a semi-competitive game. Uh, where you kind of play alongside each other uh, and you're trying to mess each other up, but not, not, it's not as directly confrontational as a lot of games that I've played. Uh, it's from the 90s. It's an old classic card game that I just love. All right, so Mage Florian, that's all that's going to happen there. 
Uh, Barrow Downs. It has automatic attacks. Undead, one strike with a prowess, eight. Uh, each character wounded must make a corruption check. Well, let's, uh, let's go for it. Uh, Faramir, my fair Faramir, is going to block. He's got a five prowess to an eight, so the only thing that's going to fail me here is Snake Eyes. Knock on, uh, knock on wood. But uh, we'll see how it goes. I got three. It was not Snake Eyes, but it was uh, real close. So I successfully entered the site. And uh, if I defeat the attacks, I can tap a character or location to play a specified item. Now here's a question I have for you, my friends. I'm really wanting to play this Sword of Gondolin. But if I tap Annalena to play it, does she is she the one that would have to have it? Like, because it says warrior only. So that might make me change my block from Faramir to not Faramir. Because I need to get this sword into play. Melkor is saying, hey Zach, any chance you guys would stream Journeys in Middle Earth? I know you usually have an aversion of games with a digital component, so I wasn't sure. Uh, I, I would I would definitely consider it. I think a game that I would probably hit before that. So I, I played a handful of scenarios on it, and at least when I was playing it, it, it felt like I was playing the technology more than the game. Uh, and that might might have changed, and so I, I'd be interested in exploring it. But another game, campaign style, that I would love to get back on the table is Imperial Assault. Okay, cool. So she can play it, she just can't use it, and then she can pass it off to uh, Faram in the next round. I think I'll do that. So I'll tap her to play Sword of Gondolin, and that's going to score me two points. She can't use it, uh, but she can find it and then throw it over to Faramir. Okay, so then that's the site phase. End of turn phase happens, and we'll flip back around to the start of the turn. Technically, I could discard a card. Um, and, you know, honestly, I'm looking at discarding. Having max cards in hand is bad. I want Return of the King and Choice of Luthien uh, to get out. Now, I can also technically this round play Emrahil, which would be super good. Um... I just feel like, I guess technically Hineth is here. Aragorn would have plus one as a Dunedain. Ah, oh, that's tough. Basically it's deciding whether or not to get rid of Rangers of Athelion to draw a card. Because I feel like my cancels are going to be super powerful if things go sideways. Yeah, I know, I, know, I know when I pass an item, I'll have to do the corruption check, but it'll be worth seeing at worst. And if I fail, well, lesson learned. Oh, man. Sure. I'm going to discard uh, Rangers of Athelion, and then I get a draw back up. I got an escape. Cancels an attack against a company. One unwounded character of your choice, and the company is wounded. No body check is required. So that's thematic. I could wound old Gandalf there to escape past the bridge. Uh, all right, so then we'll untap. Arwen doesn't untap. These go up. We'll go back to the organization phase. And it says I can play a character, so I will, uh, because Gandalf, uh, we'll just say for all intents and purposes, is directly influencing Aragorn. Um, so I have a bunch of uh, influence left over. I'm going to play Emrahil, and he has to come into play over here with uh, where Gandalf is at. And then we'll keep going down the organization phase, reorganize companies into groups of characters. So I think I might have Gandalf and Imrahil. Because like Arwen and uh, Aragorn are going to hang out. And I ultimately want them cruising around for more information, because I need to find those swords. So I'm going to break them out into their own group. We're going with three parties. And wouldn't you know it, I was prepared. I have this purple. Uh, so that's going to be Gandalf's group. It's kind of like a translucent, mystical looking. Um, they're obviously going to hang out here at the Barrow Downs. And then we'll keep going down through the organization phase, reorganize groups, decide where to move each company. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is pass items, though. Pass one item from a character to another. Uh, 
Hold on. I'm getting some hot tips here from Steven via text. See these a little better. This is my hand over here, Steven. I assume you can see them. Feel free to keep talking. These are the enemies that I've scored. There you go. That's everything. OK, uh, so I'm going to try to pass an item. I've never done this. So I'm going to look and see if I have notes on passing an item. So you pass an item, you have to make a corruption check. And my notes on corruption check says if you're required to make a corruption check, corruption points start at 0. Uh, but the item I'm passing is sort of gondolin. So it's got a corruption of 2. Uh, and Annalena is the one that's going to have to make the check. Items will have a corruption value in the bottom right, which is added to the total, so a 2. Untapped characters at the same location may tap to add 1 before I roll. So I'm not going to do that. I roll 2d6. And if the result plus 1 for each character I tapped is greater than my corruption points, then nothing happens. So technically, on Sword of Gondolin, my corruption points are 2. And I'm rolling 2d6, so the only way I can fail this corruption check is Snake Eyes. That's still 1 in 36. Uh, and then if that happens, uh, if the result plus 1 is greater than corruption points, nothing happens. If the result uh, is equal to or 1 under, the character is discarded. Uh, so then I think I would have to literally discard Faramir, or no, Annalena, if I failed this check. And then uh, if it was actually greater than 1 less, then the character would be eliminated. <laughs> Steven in chat saying, I see how you guys get trapped into these. I can't get anything else done. Hope you're doing well, Steven. Uh, you should be getting a lot done. That's why you're not here. And I'm having to do all the talking. So uh, I'll take these chances. Anything but snake eyes. Got a 12. It's anti-snake eyes. Uh, so Sword of Gondolin is going to pass to Faramir. Now he gets plus two prowess. And this is something I remembered last time. We were playing, and I was like, oh, there's definitely some tokens I would like us to make at some point, just for the lulls of it. Uh, and this is where he's got the like plus strength, and I have to remember to look down. So I'm actually going to go grab my tokens really quick and mark the fact that he's got plus two. Ryan Roper saying, LOL, I'm also working. Nathan says, ditto. Yeah, Chris, that's it's good to know the worst that could have happened there is she gets discarded, which could be, could be worse, because if you make it through your deck, you get a reshuffle. So I'm going to actually use these shields, because they kind of look like they would. The shield has a stat on it. So he's a plus two. Let me make sure there's no one else that's plus at the moment. There's not. That's just a handy so I can remember that it's happening. OK, so passing an item, that's the first time I've done that. That's actually less complicated than I think. And I think this is kind of a game that like, once you basically have the process down of all these checks and what you're looking for, because like in this case, right, it was like I was rolling a corruption check, and I needed better than a number, which is good. Um, but then like when I'm attacking, I guess, are you always trying to beat the number? Is that the case? I felt like there was one where I was it was the other, maybe the influence check. I was looking for an under number. That's funny, Ryan. Yeah, so if I fail that, not only does she get discarded, the sword does too. So she runs off with the item, which is funny. Matt asking, how's the Arena Rex play Matt doing? It's air drying. It probably still smells like champagne. If you didn't don't know what I'm talking about, watch the first 10 minutes of yesterday's stream. Uh, SFD saying, I love this game, but I never realized there was a solo version. Now I have to call in six to try to play tomorrow. <laughs> That's awesome. So this is a custom version I made uh, for a quick rundown. I'm drawing five instead of eight in my hand. And then I built a deck for each region type and each um, site type. And then I'm basically keying off of that based on hazard limits. And then I have a system for whether or not I draw the card. OK, that that that's probably where the confusion came in, right? Saying body checks. You want to roll low uh, because technically your opponent is the one making the roll. Um, so if they beat that number, then they body check you off the board. Okay, 
So I passed the item. I'm in the organization phase. I have three parties now. Um, and now I have to decide where they're going. So Aragorn and R1 are actually, oh wait, I can store an item, right? Is that when I can do this? That's what I want to do so R1 can untap next turn. Let's go back up to my uh, organization phase. Store items at Havens. Note a corruption check is required and stored items count towards your point total. So I'm going to try to store this uh, reforging. During organization phase, you may tap a sage at a haven and discard a stored reforging. Okay, I'm not doing that, but I am going to try to store it straight up. So I believe it's just a corruption check, uh, which my corruption is zero and reforging isn't a corruption, so I don't, I don't think anything bad can happen. Is that right for people that know what's going on in chat? Waiting. Still the right over there, Bryce? Thumbs up, good. Very good. Chris says, drop the reforging at Lorien for sure. Uh, no corruption check. No corruption to store events, usually. OK, cool. So reforging gets stored. So I'm going to put it over here with my uh, brigands, because there's that's my victory pile. So I have, I'm on my way to achieving uh, what I would like to be doing here. Now, I wish I still had that. Uh, Rangers of Athelion, because I could send Gandalf and Imrahil there pretty easily. So now what I'm looking for is essentially where can I play information, which is that diamond again on the map. Uh, and Amon Hen here and Rohan can do it. Don Harrow can do it as well. It's pretty close. Um, let me make sure there's not closer or better. Definitely my favorite part of the game right here. And Dimmeldale is tapped, so it actually goes. I'm going to put it in the kind of permanent discard pile. Because um, I can't go back. I've already exhausted that resource. Well, I think Ammon Hinn is, uh, is where I'm heading next. So that's where Gandalf and Imrahil are going to go. And then Faramir and Annalena, where do I want them to go? a good question. Oh, that's tapped because I did my thing. And let me get the card out really quick for M and Hen. It's right there. So that's where they're going to be going. I love that art. It's just something about the style of that art that's just killer. I mean, I guess I should send them to the nearest place where they can collect some more information just to give myself better odds. But I feel like information is always available in the like <laughs> most terrifying of places. So technically, I can get down to the Stone Circle pretty easily. Never been there. I hear it's beautiful this time of year. Um, yeah, sure. Because it's this region goes one, two, and I'm at the stone circle. So that's going to be forest, forest, stone circle. Let's see how bad stone circle is. Ah, not bad at all. And it's kind of cool because if you look at stone circle, um, and this is this is how I know I'm doing it okay. Uh, it's actually got the runes and layers icon on the top left, um, which I, I knew. But then it's got the two forests down on the side, which means that the expectation is to get there, you'd have to go through forests when you're playing with kind of the simplified movement rules, which makes sense because it's literally surrounded by forests on both sides, um, which is cool. So let's go ahead and start uh, with uh, Gandalf. Right, and those challenge decks are great. Side note, um, starting with Gandalf and Imrahil. I'm going to go ahead and slide R1 over because they're not, not being used right now. And they went from Lorien, so they went Forest, and then Rohan actually is a Borderland. So Forest, Borderland, and then Ruins and Layers. So it's going to be Borderland. And then ruins and layers. So this is the circle. 
with the half filled in, which is here, a new color arrives. Let's shuffle this up. Luke's saying, worried about ordering anything with all this nonsense with the Postal Service. Yeah, I mean, we, we ship USPS, and it's, you know, it's interesting times because, like, they're, they're definitely going through some stuff. But obviously, like, it's kind of like the stock market where if people start getting spooked, it's going to just create more problems. So uh, we haven't seen anything yet. Uh, obviously, we probably ship a few more things than the average person through USPS. But uh, outside of, like, sometimes when we're shipping uh, and there's, like, international hubs for shipping, they'll get caught up there because there's apparently a lot of volume happening. Uh, but otherwise, it's been pretty seamless. All right. So, again, uh, we first thing is going to be the borderlands, and then we're actually going to have a ruins and layer. So, borderlands here, entering Rohan, makes sense, right? And then potentially the shadows and layers. And I tried to do darker colors for the, the bad stuff. Uh, so the draw is only a one, so now I'm looking for an eight or higher on the roll. So first thing we'll do is a Borderlands. Got a six, so I actually get that card. And we have another Abductor. Well, not another, I was showing that card off earlier. Min, one strike, each non-wizard defending character wounded by the Abductor is discarded. So that makes me think I should block with Gandalf. It's also a ten, which is a lot. I will get to draw one card. I can tap a Scout. Uh, which Gandalf is to cancel one attack against this company. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to play Concealment. Instead of blocking with Gandalf, I'm just going to tap and not risk it, because technically I would need a four, which there's a, a fair num amount of rolls. <laughs> Snake Eyes or a three uh, that could fail me, and I've rolled too many threes to be comfortable with that. So I'll Conceal, and we'll just cancel the Abductor. And then my second card is actually going to be Runes and Layers. And again, I need an eight to not see the card. And I got an 11, so I don't, don't get a second card. They've officially showed up. Next, we're going to get Faramir and Annalena. And they are moving to the stones, which is forest, forest, ruins, and layers. So I'm going to do one forest and one ruins and layers. Uh, and there's a card draw of one. So again, I need an eight to not have to get a card. I uh, don't get the first one, which is the forest. So now it would be ruins and layers if I don't get an eight or better. I got a seven, so we're actually going to get a ruins and layers. And we got ghouls. Look at this art. They don't make art like this anymore. Ryan Roper saying, since the pandemic, my junk mail delivery has dropped to almost nothing. Good for me, bad for USPS. Yeah. J Jonathan's saying he's been getting all of his orders on time. That's good. Uh, so ghouls. We find ghouls. Looks like they're up on the screen. Undead, five strikes. But they're only seven. So here's how it's going to work. So I can assign basically to any untapped character. So Annalena and Faramir will each get one. I technically get to draw a card. Got another copy of Gandalf. Can I do anything with a second copy of Gandalf? It's a good question. Uh, so it's five strikes. So one and one. And there's three left over. So I'm going to apply. You can do this one of two ways. You can apply it yourself. You could roll for it. Or you could just apply it in the worst way possible. Um, and I do believe there's three left over, so I can give like Faramir minus two and Annalena minus one, or like three minus three to uh, Annalena, which could be really bad. Uh, but I'm gonna go ahead and do two to Faramir, which is gonna basically cancel out that sort of Gondolin. And I'm gonna do minus one to Annalena. Uh, and that's how those five strikes are gonna resolve on the ghouls, instead of, you know, it's not like five actual attacks happening because I only have two characters. Brian, I think that's actually really clever. Um, he's saying, I think you should follow the path, so roll for forest, then forest, then ruins and layers, but stop anytime you hit the hazard limit. That makes a lot of sense. So I was doing it the other way be before I basically added the mechanism where if you roll, you could not get a card. So uh, I'll resolve it this way this turn, but I'll, I think I'll adopt that moving forward. And that, that's true, because if you move four, you have a higher chance of hitting the hazard limit, because it is a riskier play to do that. I like that a whole lot. 
So we're going to go Faramir at minus 2 uh, against a 7. So I'm going to go ahead and... Do I have any items that they're going to... No, no items that I'm planning on them playing. So he'll go ahead and tap. So he's going to get his f full 5 uh, prowess. He doesn't get the modification from Sword of Gondolin because it's plus 2. But that means that even with the Snake Eyes, he's going to pass this test. So he passes. Then Annalena is a minus 1. So she's a 2 to the uh, 7. So she'll go ahead and tap. And so she actually needs a five. This is this is a little riskier. Which I got it. I got a nine. So they both tap. I defeat the ghouls. Uh, I beat both strikes. So then I'm actually going to get a score that point against the ghouls. And that's why I have everything sleeved differently. Because uh, if I didn't, then I would have no idea where to put those cards after I was done. So uh, we moved from the barrel down successfully. Uh, that's going to go away because it was tapped. Now I'm at the stone circles uh, where information is playable, but I'm not going to enter it. I don't have any ready characters. I don't have any information I want to play. Uh, so we're fine. Now, coming back to Gandalf and Imrahil, they can also play information, technically, I think. Let me make sure that's right. Yep. But I didn't draw any information to play. So nothing's going to happen. I won't enter any sites, and we'll go to the end phase where the turn is. All right, first thing we'll do is untap, and Arwen's going to actually get to untap now. And at the end of the round, I can technically discard a card, and I will discard Gandalf unless there's some good reason that he wa I want to keep him around and draw back up, because you get a one at the very end. I got a block, which is good. It's going to let one of my warriors uh, block without having to exhaust or tap. And it's super, like, I love this, because, like, I have these sites out, I have the map, I have these three characters that are floating around the map at different places. Uh, Ryan saying, did you resolve a hazard for Aragorn and Arwen? So if they, if they don't move, do I still resolve a hazard? And they're out of Haven. So I didn't think I, I could hazard it out. And then Chris saying, you don't actually get the marshaling points if you only deal with part of the full amounts of the strikes, if I remember correctly. That's correct. I had to beat both strikes. Um, and they didn't have any health, so I just scored the point, I believe. Uh, Chris saying, Anduril is also an information card. Uh, there can be hazards at Haven. How? Okay. How how does the hazard of the Haven work? I didn't know that was a rule. What do I key it against? Basically, is my question. Didn't know orcs could get into Rivendell. <laughs> yeah, it's scary, right, Rafe? Right? Chris says, yes, but only hazards keyed to the site. Uh, but if it's a haven, it, it, I don't know that anything can be keyed to it, right? So Chris says, you can play some permanent event or the character, on, or in general, on the character. Gotcha. I don't have any hazards keyed against haven, so no hazard cards. Untap, organization phase. I'll hang, hang where they're at. Um, then I get to decide where I'm moving. I think it's time for Aragorn and Arwen uh, to become the king and queen. <laughs> you know what I mean? I got these points burning a hole in my hands that I want to get out. So let's see. Can they make it all the way to Minas Tirith? Uh, they're here. So one, two, three. They can. They're going to do that. So they're going to go through a f forest, borderlands. Let's just walk it through. Uh, well, before I walk it through. Forest, borderlands, uh, Anorian looks to be... I can't tell what Anorian is. Which, which of these icons is it? Is it the circle uh, with the... I guess it would make sense. Uh, region symbols have the circles behind them, so that clears that right up. Uh, forest, borderlands, and then free domains. Then I would arrive at Minas Tirith. So I'm going to go ahead and get Minas Tirith out, so I can see it. Those the little symbols, like the shape behind. You look at like uh, Sword of Gondolin, that square being a major item 
point scoring card, even the locations, like the difference between a region and a site symbol being huge. Uh, I, I wish I, there was a big bold sentence at the first of the rule book. It's like, hey, the symbols behind stuff are super relevant. It makes so much more sense once that clicks. OK, so they're moving to Minas Tirith to go get that crown. And then ultimately, I'm going to do that first to try to draw extra cards. And then I'll probably move. I'll probably just stay with Faramir and Alina and also uh, Imrahil and Gandalf, just trying to wait out the information that I need. So they'll hang out, no regrouping, no storing, all that kind of stuff. And then long event phase, technically, there's no long events in play. So that's all fine. And then we'll start with Aragorn and Arwen. So they're going to move to Minas Tirith. And I'm going to switch to the new movement rules that I Ryan helped me invent on the spot. Uh, so the first thing I'll do is Forest. And uh, Minas Tirith is a minus 2. So I need a 9. Let me make sure that I like this plan. Yeah. Need a 9. Got a 7. So I'll get a Forest card. We got the brigands. Look who's back. Back again. Two strikes. Uh, if any strike of brigands wounds a character that comes to me, they discard an item of the defender's choice. I don't want to lose my cloak. Um, we'll go ahead and oh, I get a draw first. So Minas Trance is draw two. It's got two characters. It's not ideal. This could be rough, my friends. Um, two strikes. So Aragorn and Arwen both have to get one, which is a bummer. All right, let's. Chris says, just check my rule book, and I've been playing this wrong for years. The hazard creature is only defeated if all the strikes against it are directed against a company are defeated. That's right. Um, well, let's go ahead and block with Aragorn so he doesn't exhaust to do this. He needs a snake eyes or better. He got it. Uh, then I'll go ahead and block with Arwen. She's a 2 to this 8, uh, so I need a 6. And I got snake eyes, so I fail. So now I have to make a body check. Uh, which would be good to see. This could be bad. I don't want to lose Arwen. That'd make Aragorn very upset. Body checks. If I get hit by a strike, roll 2d6. If value is greater than my body stat, character is eliminated. So her body stat is an 8. So if I roll a 9 or higher, she's eliminated. Matt asking, is there any chance that you bring this to the table on stream again? Please do. Would you consider trying to destroy the one ring? Don't get me wrong, though. I love all the Aragorn stuff here. Uh, yes, I, I, would, I definitely want to build a dunk deck. I uh, try to dunk the ring into Mordor, and if I do, uh, someday in the future, I will probably have that on the stream. All right, so if we get a nine or higher. Arwen's out of here. Got an eight. Woo! The pressure was real. I rolled it like it was nonchalant, but I really didn't want that to happen. So I didn't defeat both strikes, um, but I did uh, block, and then I think I get wounded, right? If value is less than the body stat, your character remains in play. Um, I don't, do I get wounded from taking that hit? I don't defeat the character because I didn't defeat both strikes. <laughs> Matt, I saw that five and got a little worried. That's hilarious. Yeah, that was intense. That was definitely the most intense moment so far. Uh, so what happens when I fail or I succeed that part of it? Am I fine? OK, I'm wounded. So she's going to flip. Flippity flop. OK, so then the next thing I get uh, is the borderlands? Border holes? Nope. Borderlands. You know what? I'm starting to understand why these are labeled this. Aha! So borderlands, because uh, I'm going through Rohan. Need eight or better. Got a seven. So that's going to hit me in my hazard limit. I like that a lot. I'll get this card. Despair of the Heart. Corruption. A non-wizard, non-hobbit character receives two corruption points. Target character makes a corruption check each time a character in his company becomes wounded. 
cannot be duplicated on a given character. During the organization phase, a character with this card may tap to attempt to remove it and make a roll. If the result is greater than four, discard this card. So Aragorn is distraught that Arwen got hurt. Um, and so he has despair of the heart until he uh, removes it. But I'm at the hazard limit, so I make it to Minas Tirith. And then uh, we I have too many cards in hand. So I'm going to go ahead and discard Mabalon, keep E1, just in case something happens to R1. According to the movies, it's Aragorn's backup option. Um, and then we're going to stay here with Faramir and Annalena. They're going to basically be in a Ruins and Lair, so I'll make a check. It's a minus one. I need an eight to not take a card. Got a four, so they're taking a card. I do get to draw a card, though. There's Glamdring. And the card they get is Wisp of Pale Sheen. Undead, one strike. Attacker chooses defending characters after any character facing a strike whose mind is equal to or lower than the strike's prowess must tap if untapped following the strike, unless the strike is canceled. So I don't have a cancel. It's only a six, though. But both of these characters' mind is less than this of value. So... And the attacker would get to choose, so I would technically want to choose the worst thing for me. Um, hmm. So I think Faramir is who I would choose, because basically there's no way I can fail the test. But uh, because his mind is less, he has to tap. And then... I defeated it, so I'll actually score the, score the point. I'm racking up minions over here. Okay, and then t technically, if I was playing against a live opponent, they could play two cards that are matched to that, right? Is that correct? Because if so, I think I should make a second check here, even though I'm staying at the stone circles. How's everyone doing out there? Bryce, you look like you're doing all right. Herman says yes. All right, I'm going to make another check. Need eight. There it is. Great. Uh, so they could choose to enter. I don't. I want to get Glamdring over here on um, Gandalf. But it's a major item, and they're not in a major item kind of location. So that's a bummer. So let's do their check. It's a minus one, so I need an eight to cancel the first one. Didn't, uh, so we'll get a bad card, and I get Plague of Whites. The prowess of all undead attacks is incre It's a long event. Uh, so I'm going to play this. It's just going to come into play, and it's going to stay in play until my next long event phase. So then I'll roll again. I need an eight. Failed. Got a seven, so I'll get another one. Uh, and this Plague of Whites says... Uh, undead attacks are increased by one. So technically, if I hit that first, right... Undead across the board would all be worse for me, but I didn't. Then I get Muster Disperses. Effects of Faction already in play. The Faction's player makes a roll. Faction is discarded as a result, plus his unused general influence is less than 11. I don't have any factions in play, so that's just essentially going to be a dead card. So it's kind of cool because it simulates when you're playing. Sometimes they don't have a combination of things that do much. But in that case, like that could have made the white attack over here worse. Uh, or if I'd had a faction out, Muster Disperses would be very frustrating. Matt says, anytime I see this map of Middle Earth, I'm doing good. Well, that's good. Ben also said, Ben Clapperton, what's up? Hope you're doing well. Uh, all right. So they made it. Uh, they're hanging out in Ammon Hen. Information or minor items. Unfortunate. So we'll go back around. Oh, and now I get to play some cards, though, because now I'm in the uh, sight phase. So Aragorn and Arwen are going to enter Minas Tirith. There's no automatic attacks, so that's good. Uh, I'm going to play... I, can I play both Choice of Luthien and Return of the King on uh, this turn? Because if so, that's awesome. That's what we want. 
Return of the King says, only playable in Minas Tirith and only if Denethor is not in play. Aragorn's direct influence is plus three. Keep this in play if Aragorn leaves. Smeagol and Chris saying, yup. All right, let's do it. The King has returned. He has plus three direct influence, so I could play a lot of characters on him. Uh, and then Arwen has made the choice of Luthien. That's a, I'm, I'm rereading slash I'm actually listening to the audiobook of Lord of the Rings right now. Fantastic, uh, the like poems and songs because the like guy reading it actually like sings them and he all he does all different character voices, so it's just wonderful. Matt says, no, that's true love. She ch Arwen chose mortality even after getting wounded on the journey. Lone Rapture says, this is an epic looking play area. Yeah, this map is the, it's where all the magic is. Uh, so I'll play those two. That's going to clear my hand a little bit, which is good. Um, and then luckily, so tell me if I can do this. Um, Gandalf is in Edoras, Edoras, and Ewan is in my hand. She, her home site is Edoras, so I assume on the organization phase I could actually play her into Gandalf's company because they're at the home site uh, and he's there. Uh, or how do the rules exactly read when it comes to playing characters once your wizard's in play? Robert uh, Purden says, I need to get this card. Which card? Smeagol, I think you're saying yes to me. Is that right? Ryan Rober saying yes, so that's a double yes. Okay, great. Well, let's uh, we untapped, and then we'll go to the organization phase, so I can play one character. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and play Ewan. She's gonna join Gandalf and Imrahil, which is cool, right? They went to Rohan, they picked up a friend, and then now that I have Glamdring, now I have a, a mission, right? And this is what's cool because the hand basically forces you to tell the story, which is I want to be able to play a major item, and major items are the square boxes on the map, so. I can't go here. Uh, I'm liking Ammon Hen. Oh, wait, I'm in Ammon Hen. I've been lied to. So Ammon Hen on the card says information items minor. But then Ammon Hen on the map has the, oh, it says minor item. I got it. I was reading it wrong. So I need to go play a major item. Those dead marshes, though. So I assume, can, can someone help me with this? I, I, I think it's the Anduin River running in between Rohan and Dagger, Daggerland, Daggerlad. Uh, can I not pass that, or is the uh, river its own, uh, is it the water wavy type? That would be pretty cool, because I have a water deck that I didn't think I would get to use, but then I noticed the Anduin right there in between those. Uh, Chris saying, which company do you want to put Glamdring on? I want to put it on Gandalf's company. Smeagol saying it blocks movement. Cannot pass. So you have to walk around it. it does it end in between Rohan and Dago, Daggerland, lad? I don't know why. I can't. It's either Daggerland or Daggerland. I can't say it right. So like to get there, would I have to go up to wall, the walled foothills, go through the brown lands, and then go over to Dagor Lad? Yep, Ryan said just said what I just said, uh, which is uh, what up, David? Uh, saying whoa, I just joined. This looks like some kind of crazy Middle Earth tarot reading. Uh, it kind of is. I, the key part of this game, it's the middle of CCG, it's from the 90s, we're throwing back here on Thursday, is this map. Uh, and I have these little miniatures that represent the various companies I have in play. So there's Aragorn Arwen. Aragorn just became king again. Gandalf, Emrahil, and Eowyn are in Rohan, and then Faramir and Annalene are over here in the stones. Smeagol says, but you really don't want to go to the Dead Marshes for a major item. Hmm. Well, let's see where else I can go. 
Dol Goldor, that sounds like a bad place. I didn't know that that was so close to Mirkwood. I'm learning things. I'm a very, uh, like, directionally, uh, I'm pretty good with, like, where I'm at. And so you hear these names in the book all the time, but it's hard to really know exactly where they're at. David says, this looks cool as heck. Why didn't I know about this in the 90s? Yeah, I know. Uh, J Jason's saying, it's because you didn't have Scry or Inquest magazine. Dagorland. Dagorlad. I can't get it right. Ryan saying, Gap of Eisen, Glittering Cave. I do like that Glittering Cave card. Or Isengard. Where's Isengard? Should be close to a row. There it is. Gap of Eisen. Isengard. I feel like Gandalf going to Isengard to get Glamdring makes too much sense. So he's going to do that. He's going to go to Isengard. We're going to leave Ammon Hinn behind. Because it's not tapped. It's not going to go anywhere. It's going to stay in the deck. So I could come back if I wanted to. I like Isengard just for the theme of it. I feel like that's somewhere that old Gandalf would go. So they're going to go there. And we'll leave that in case they get rejected somehow. Uh, Aragorn and Arwen. Now, here's the thing. Choice of Luthien says, Discard of Arwen moves to a site not in Anurian, Lebanon, Lambdon, Belphalas, or Anphalas. So... I'm going to move these here, 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 here. Can they not go to Ithilien? Nope. They can go here, though. Uh huh. Let's see. I want to find information in this region they can be. So the Vale of Eric is pretty good. I'll probably go there. They're going to... And I didn't play any items at Minas Tirith, so that's good. It's going to stay around. So they're going to go to the Vale of Eric. Oh, no. I don't have the card. They're going there anyway. I'm going to look up the card. I assume you have that on the screen, Bryce. I can't hear you, but I trust you. Veil of Eric uh, is just a 1-1. One, one. So that's where they're going to go. And then Gandalf is going to Isengard. We're going to get that out. And then where do I want to send Faramir? I feel like they... will just go down to the stones because that's where I can get more major items in case I draw them. Stone circles to the stones, I like that. Okay, so let's start with um, Gandalf because I know I can play that item already. So they're gonna move from Borderlands, I believe is what it's called. Yep, I'm starting to get it. Over to the Gap of Eisen slash Isengard, which is gonna be Ruins and Layers, <laughs> and Borderland. So Borderland, Borderland, Ruins and Layers. Uh, so the first will roll. It's a minus two, because you see the Isengard has that minus two. I get to draw cards, though. Elven Cloak and a Concealment. So I can tap a Scout uh, to cancel an attack against this uh, company. And that's, is an attack, is that one strike? Or is that all of the strikes on a single card? And this Plague is gone.
Carmen saying, don't like that some sites are rare. I assume that's where Aragorn and Armour are going, or some random rare site. Uh, John is saying, I recently started looking into more of the physical world of Lord of the Rings. Has anyone done research on the rest of the world besides just Middle Earth? Uh, Scott says, some cards have more than one attack, but usually all strikes on a single card. Gotcha. Assassin is a good example of a, of a creature that has multiple attacks. Okay. Yeah, because Isengard itself, right, has wolves, three strikes with seven prowess. So, like, concealment, I could tap and cancel all three of those, which would be super strong. Um, so the first thing, we're going to do Borderlands. Need a nine. Got an eight. So I will get the card. Man, I'm getting tired of these brigand brigands. You know what I mean? Brigands... Well, luckily, I have this here, Vanishment. So I'll play it. Spell, wizard only, cancels an attack against the wizard's company. Wizard makes a corruption check modified by minus two. He has a one. Healing Herbs also is a one. So a two, corruption. And I assume the minus two means it's a four. So then technically, if I get less than a four, I would lose. Is that right? Let me go down to the corruption check and read it. All right. Point starts at zero. Items have a corruption value, which adds to your total. Uh, so my total is a two. But I guess vanishment is a minus two. So am I back to zero? Or is it a, a four is now the number? Jason saying this is advanced talisman. Matt says it's not a tense you hear every day. <laughs> what up, Taylor? Welcome. Oh, Gandalf has a bonus on corruption. So he's incorruptible. I get it. So he's plus one, but then minus two. So then technically I'm at a one. Okay, minus two is to the roll. That makes sense. He's harder to corrupt. So plus one and a minus two to my roll. So I roll the three. Plus one is a four. Minus two is a two. And my corruption check is a two. This is what I'm saying. This is dense. My corruption points is a one because of the healing herbs, right? So I believe I pass by one. <laughs> so let's walk that back. I roll the die. Gandalf is a plus one to my roll, so that makes my three a four. And my corruption point total is one from healing herbs. But vanishment is a minus two. So literally I add one, so I'm at a four. I take two away, now I'm at a two. My corruption points is a one. So I pass the corruption check by one. I believe I did that right. If I did that wrong, let me know, chat. And if I lose the game automatically, then we'll choose a different course. Uh, so then I, that's fine. I pass that, and I have one. So then I actually now get the uh, ruins and layers card. If I get an eight or low, or if I get lower than an eight, which I did. So I'm going to get a ruins and layers card. Okay, cool. I passed by one. Figured it out. Times are evil. All offering attempts and influence attempts. This is a long event. All offerings and influence attempts are modified by minus three. And so that's a long event. It's going to apply until literally the beginning of my next turn. So if I was trying to do an influence, uh, like influence a faction, uh, or make an offering, whatever that ends up meaning, it's minus three. Uh, and then they make it to Isengard. Meanwhile, uh, Faramir and Annalena are going to the stones. Uh, so I get to draw one card. And I got a dodge. Okay, that's pretty good. Uh, and then they literally moved from uh, wilderness to wilderness to ruins and lairs. So we'll do the first wilderness, which is the region they came from. It's minus one, so I need a eight or higher. Got an eight. We'll do the second wilderness. Got an eight. And then we'll do the actual ruins and layers. Got a nine. So totally just scooted past that. And then Aragorn and Arwen are going to the Vale of Eric, which is 
in the, let me find it. It's got this icon. I haven't used that one yet. Here it is. So this is a border hold. I'm actually going to put this over here. Oh, these are bad. These are real bad. Um, yeah, so this is a border hold. And they're coming from, let's stack these in a way where you can see them. So they're at Isengard. And this can go back. And this has a draw of one. I got that the Knights of Dole Amrath, which is right here, which is super close to this. So uh, hopefully I can get down there and get it. Although I think Emmer Hill is the one that's really good against them. Yeah, Emmer Hill is the has a plus to influencing that particularly. All right. So. Uh, where are we at? Veil of Eric. Uh, they go from free domains to borderlands to border hold. And this is a minus one, so I need an eight. Failed. So this is going to be in Minas Tirith. He's the king. How does this work? Free domains. Which I also haven't seen yet. Look at that. I'm hitting him up. I haven't I haven't done the auto strikes on Isengard yet, by the way. I, I I didn't enter the site yet. Okay, so I get this card, which is greed. Playable on a site. So we'll go ahead and play this on uh, where they're going. And then essentially every time I play an item, everyone that is not getting the item makes a corruption check. Fine by me. Uh, and then they're going from there to Borderlands, so I'll make a roll. Eight or better means I avoid it. I got it. And then they're going to end up in the border holds. And I'll actually get that one. So that is this one, I believe. Yep. Uh, Ryan, the vanishment was for the bad card that I drew, the brigands, because I didn't want to deal with the strikes. And then my intent is to dodge. Nope. Oh, no, then my I'm going to concealment to cancel all the Isengard attacks. I got a Fell Winter. Each border hold receives an automatic attack. Wolves, three strikes with seven prowess. So that's here, because that's where I'm at. So it's got an automatic attack, um, which I believe Yeah, so if I want to enter that location, it's got an extra wolves automatic attack, which I won't be doing because I don't have anything I want to play on them. Um, so they traveled. Minas Tirith goes away. Let's put that back.
And then stone circle is going to go away as well. And then, so there at Eric, it's got the fell winner and the greed on it. I'm not going to do anything with that. Uh, there at Isengard, um, I'm actually going to enter Isengard and then I'll use concealment. Uh, tap a scout to cancel an attack against this company. So the automatic attacks uh, is the wolves with three strikes. So I'm going to tap uh, Eowyn to play concealment. We'll cancel that. And then now I'm going to exhaust Isengard and exhaust Gandalf to play Glamdring. He gets plus three prowess. Let me get my little tokens. And it's worth two points, which is pretty sweet. But he gets plus three prowess to a maximum of eight or nine if he's against orcs. So he's a six naturally. This will make him an eight, uh, unless he's fighting orcs, in which case it makes him a nine, which I like. He's got his sword. And then technically I can play a minor item. And I have this elven cloak, so I may as well do it. So I'm going to, when you play an item, uh, or a major item, or information, or whatever, you can tap another character to play a minor item on them. So I'll play Elven Cloak. That way Aragorn has an Elven Cloak, and Gandalf has an Elven Cloak. Not Gandalf, but Gandalf's party. Herman, I, I totally agree. So as I see potential to make these hazards decks very thematic. Doors of Night tech, for example. And that's what I was definitely trying to play on, where it's like, I have three parties roaming the countryside, and you have something like Fell Winter, which is basically each border hold gets this thing. Uh, and that would affect everyone that is, is doing, you know, at those kind of locations. Or same thing with this, um, I think it should have gone away. The times are evil. Uh, no, it's this round where my influence attempts are modified. So you have cards that, like, affect everything else. And, you know, it's the kind of thing where, like, I tried to thematically put trolls where trolls would go or orcs where orcs would go. But then, you know, like there is um, some Nazgul in the forest, right? And so they might come out. And they're, they're the Nazgul that help like spiders and wolves. And then it was basically trying to be thoughtful to make it where there is some synergy. But, you know, obviously not necessarily just like slaughtering you. Matt saying, what are the tokens uh, on Gandalf and Faramir? So I'm using it to mark any prowess bonuses. They're gray, like the shields in the corners. And they're from our Keyforge uh, compatible Archon tokens. So I uh, played there, and then they aren't going to play anything at the stones because I don't have anything left to play. But I do have this Knights of Dole Amrith, so you can bet that I'm going to be trying to get Emberhill down there. And is Dole Amrith, it, I can't tell if it's in Anphalos or Belphalos. Do you guys know which one it is? Or is it actually... Ooh, is it the Bay of Belfast? Is that where it's at? It seems like it's kind of in the ocean. Well, it's apparently in Belfast. Okay. So technically, let me see how they can get there. He, yeah, they can get there. It's just a heck of a move. Okay. Um... Then we go to the end phase. So I can discard a card if I want and then draw. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this escape. Um, now, technically, escape's good. I remember why I put it in now. Besides, it cancels attacks. Um, you take an unwounded character of your choice and they become wounded. But then, you know, I have these healing herbs. The bear can tap and discard this item to heal a character in his company, changing the character's status from wounded to well. So basically, it lets me tap to cancel an attack in like an indirect way if I want to. But I have better cards that I'm actually looking for at this point. So we're going to discard one, and then I draw back up to my hand size. I want my swords. There's Narsal. And I got a stealth, which is really good. It's going to be really good because I can tap to basically avoid enemies with this party. Uh, Narsal, unique weapon, plus one to prowess and direct influence. So... Narsal, I have the stored reforging. And basically, I, I want to get Narsal on Aragorn. And then I need to find um, Anduril. And then my dreams will be complete. So we'll go to the start of the turn. We're ready. Uh, the location's not going to ready, but Imrahil we're ready. He's got that Elven Cloak now. Eowyn we're ready. Gandalf we're ready. Arwen is now ready. 
Aragorn is a king. <sighs> then we'll go to the organization phase. Technically, these long events will all fall away. Um, this goes. This goes. And then in the organization phase, I can try to get rid of this Despair of Heart. So Despair of the Heart, not a wizard, not a hobbit, receives two corruption points. Um, I'll mark that here. Now, do I get rid of those corruption points if he gets rid of the Despair of the Heart, or do those corruption points stick around? It says corruption, uh, two corruption points, target character makes corruption tech each time the character in his company becomes wounded. During the organization phase, the character with this card may tap to attempt to remove it, make a roll. If the result is greater than four, discard it. I'm actually not going to do that yet because I don't want to tap Aragorn. Um, oh. Veil of Eric doesn't let me play. It does say I can play information, but it doesn't say that on the card. Can I play information at Vale of Eric? It says on the map that I can, but the card I'm looking at online doesn't doesn't look like it can. Smeagol says, rolling to remove the corruption card untapped is basically free. How is it free? I'm curious how that is the case. Because you untap first, and then it's the organization phase where you can try to get rid of it. So I'd have to tap to do it. Hmm. So actually, I don't even need to play information. What I need them to do, though, is greater item bound. And I need them to be able to do that without leaving. You know what I mean? Minus Morgul, not going there. It's terrifying. Them Nazgul, though. Uh, looks like my option is Tophilos, because Arwen can't go there. No, she can. Is is Tophilos that island, actually? That would be a bummer if this is all the case. I'm trapped. Oh. So this uh, Despair of the Heart, you can make the test at minus three if you don't tap. Is that correct? Smigo said, uh, yes. Uh, it got a rata that only greater items playable there is Scroll of Isildur. Okay, well, I'll try it. Uh, so it's greater than a four. I'm at minus three. So I got a two, so I failed. Which is fine. Um, so I think... Um, I'm going to put this up here. That's where they're at. Gandalf and Imrahil and Eowyn are going to make their way down to... Uh, where to go? Dol Amrith, which is in Belfalas, and they can go there through Rohan, Anorian, Lebanon, Belfalas. 
which is four. Uh, and then I also have stealth, so they'll actually be able to avoid all enemies during that process. And then I'm going to go ahead and get Dull Amrith out. That's where they'll be going. And then Aragorn and Arwen have to be careful uh, because she has that choice of Luthien that I don't want to lose. She can go to Balfalas. So I'm going to actually have them meet up uh, with the other crew. They probably are also going to go to Dol Amrith. And I'm... Well, no. Mm -mm. I need F Faramir. Is he... I'm going to send them back to the signal tower to get Narsal into play. Or no, they're at the stones. They can already, they can just hang out and play a major item. So I'll probably have him. Now, I could do this, right? During the organization phase, I could break Arwen and Aragorn up. And I could send Aragorn over to the stones to try to meet up with Faramir. And the next next round, they could form together and pass off the sword. Um, and I could send Arwen down to Dol Amrith to meet up with Gandalf. Is that right? Can I do that? Smeagol saying yes. I think so. I think I'm getting to the next level. Is that correct? Absolutely. All right. Aragorn and Arwen are parting ways. Aragorn's heading to the stones to join up with Faramir and Annalena. Uh, Arwen's going to be heading over to Dol Amrith. Now, even though they're going to the same place, uh, when do those parties actually form up? Is, is it during the next organization phase when they can actually hang out together? Man, can you imagine, back in the 90s, when these games were coming out, like, if I didn't have people on chat to just ask that know what's going on, this would, this would take so much work to try to figure out these rules. But, like, you don't get the amount of granularity and just, like, uh, the, like, flavor in these, in modern games on this level. Like, it's, it's crazy what they're doing here, actually, like, the amount they're putting into this. Matt says, Aragorn R1 breaking up. The tabloids in Middle Earth are going to go crazy. Okay, during the sight phase, at the end of the movement phase, they can join back up. All right, let's do it. Aragorn's going to the stones. Uh, Faramir and Annalena are staying there to meet up with Aragorn. Uh, let's go with Gandalf's group first. Um, I'm going to use stealth. I'm going to tap Ewan. So... To have a scout to play at the, in, at the end of the organization phase, only the scout's company size is three or less. It is. No creature hazards may be played on that company this turn. So they're stealthed. Let's slide these up. And they're on their way there. So, and now they, they have three people. So this, we'll see what happens. But they're going from Borderlands Borderlands, free domains, free domains, and then they arrive at Dol Amrith. So uh, Borderlands, Borderlands, free domains. Let's start there. And this is a minus one, so I need an eight. Failed. Borderlands. Uh, which is this one. Eyes of the Shadow. Environment may only be played if Gates of Morning is not in play. It's not. The hazard limit is increased by two for each moving company with a size of less than four that also contains a wizard or a non-ranger character with a mind of six or more. Ranger, six or more. Wizard. Permanent event, too. Oh, that's crazy. All right, so Eyes of the Shadow stay out. 
And basically, until I exhaust my deck, uh, the hazard limit is increased by two for every moving company with the size of, so all my moving companies, that also contains a wizard or non-ranger with a mind of six or more. Justin says, I love this game. Still have massive amounts of cards. Was about to sort through them, too. What a coincidence. <laughs> Smeagol says, Middle Earth CCG basically handed out a free law degree after you learned the rules. Miguel says, back in the day in your local group, everyone was just making up their own rules. All right, so I, Eyes of the Shadow stays out, and the hazard limit's plus two for any moving company that contains a wizard or non-ranger with a mind of six or more. <coughs> uh, but... Okay, so Emberhill actually qualifies here. Because it has an, a wizard or a non-ranger of mine six or more. So their hazard limit is plus two. And that's number one of three possible. So we went uh, free domains, free domains. Now we're borderlands. Need Nate. Got it. And then we go another of the same. Need Nate. Got a seven. So this is going to be borderlands, which is here. We got wargs, but I'm stealth, so I can't get them. And then we actually now arrive at uh, Dull Amrith, which is going to be a freehold, which is just a castle by itself. And I haven't used this one yet, so if I don't get an eight, I'll actually get a shuffle a new deck. Got a seven. Let's get it. Let me make sure this icon matches. Yep, Freehold. This is also a bad deck. Watch yourself. Muster Disperses. After a faction affects a faction already in play. Uh, I don't have any factions yet, but I'm about to, so that would be real rough. Uh, and then I've arrived. So then Isengard's going to get discarded because it was exhausted. And then Aragorn is going to move. Uh, and technically, I get to draw a card from that. There it is, Anduril, fl the Flame of the West. Uh, so I'm almost done, almost going through my deck. So that's going to be a good. Assuming I can achieve that, I'll probably count my points and see where I'm at. Um, so then I am moving Aragorn to the stones. Uh, so he's going to go through Borderlands, Wilderness, into the stones. So Borderlands first, and it's a minus one. Got it, passed. Wilderness didn't pass, so we'll get a Wilderness card. Ooh, Dire Wolves. Um, they have four strikes and an eight. I'm at a six. I'm in wilderness. So actually, they'll assign the strike to me, and then the extras will be minus one modifier. So I'm minus three, but I'm using my elven cloak to avoid their wolves. And then I make it to the stones, which is a ruins and lairs. I need an eight to not get it. I got it, so I get the card, wherever it's at. There it is. I get Ghosts, Undead, three strikes. After attack, each character wounded by Ghosts makes a corruption check modified by minus one. So, let's... Go ahead and dodge. 
No, that doesn't matter. I'll just uh, I'll just exhaust. So I'm a six to this one strike, uh, which is a nine. So I need a three, but I'm minus two because it's three strikes. So the two extra are going to be minus one, minus one. So I'm at a four to a nine. I need a five. Oh, wait. Ghouls is the wrong card. Wrong indeed. Where is that logo? There it is. I, I was pulling from the wrong deck. So the stones is ruins and layers, which is these red sleeves. Red for terrifying. Jason says, this game has April Lee art, probably some of her earliest CCG art. Uh, what else did she end up go, going to do art for? All right. So instead I get Choking Shadows, Short Event, Environment, Modify the Prowess of One Automatic Attack out of Ruins and Layers by plus two. Um, so that'll hang, and then the way I'm going to resolve that is just the next time that would happen, I have to resolve it. Um, so now he's at the stones. They've traveled to Dole Amrith. Arwen is going to travel to Dole Amrith. So she's going to go from Borderlands into Free Domains. No, Borderlands into Freeholds. So first one, need eight. I get to draw a card. Missed. So uh, that's going to be Borderlands, which is here. Stormcrow, the direct influence of each wizard is reduced by two. Discard all resource permanent events that have been played on each company with a wizard. Uh, no resource permanent events. And this is a permanent event. So my direct influence of my wizard is minus two. So let me make sure I'm still good. So Ewen is being, no, Emrahil is being directly influenced by Gandalf, so he doesn't count. Same with Eowyn. That's uh, eight, and he has eight because he's minus two, so that's fine. And then I'm fine across the board, but that stays out. Uh, and then Arwen is going to get a uh, card at Dole Amrith, which is a freehold if I don't get an eight. I got a seven. So we will get a freehold card, which is this one. Call of Home, playable on a non-wizard character that is not the bearer of the one ring. The character's player must make a roll. Return the character to the player's hand if the result plus his unused general influence is less than 10. So my unused general uh, right now, because Ar Arwen and Aragorn split. So he's 9, 10, 11, 12. This doesn't count for anything. Plus 5, 17. So I have three unused influence plus I roll. And if this is less than 10, so I have to get a 7 or better or otherwise Arwen returns to my hand. I got a seven. Woo! Now, if she had returned to my hand, um, what would happen to Choice of Luthien? Would that bounce or would it go to discard pile? What up, Herman? Yeah, I, I uh, s did something. I dodged. I dodged the wolves. Okay, so if Arwen had bounced there, then uh, Choice of Luthien would actually get discarded, which is good to know. Okay, so Aragorn now is actually here, and these are permanents that have stayed in play. And Arwen is now with this group. So Faramir, uh, Aragorn, I'm going to take Faramir's off the table because Aragorn's the new captain. I'm the captain now. Uh, they're here, and they're here. Uh, and then Dole Amrith doesn't have any, so I can just make this check. Knights of Dole Amrith. 
Uh, unique playable at Dole Amrith if the influence check is greater than eight. So I have a Dunedain and I have Imrahil there who gets plus two, so he's plus three um, to my influence check. And I believe I need an eight, so it's plus three, so I literally have to roll a five on 2d6. Is that correct? What up, Slip? Sam Morning, this looks epic with so many cards out. Interestingly, right, like if, if you take away the map, um, it's not that many. It's like one, two, three, four, five. 17. This is my hand. This is what I've scored. Uh, so, definitely interesting. Let me just see if I have the influence rules down here. During the site phase, a character at the same size as an opponent's nope. Make an influence check. Roll 2d6. Plus the... And that's an influence. That's not what I'm trying to do, I don't think. To the rule book. All right, let me find influencing a faction. Uh, factions, if one, or, one of your characters is at the site specified on a faction card, he can tap to attempt to play the faction card. So I'll tap Emerald Hill. And then it says, if the character successfully influences the faction, uh, the faction is placed in your play area. So go to page 28. Uh, That's not helpful. All right, so chat's helping me out here. Scott says, if Emmerhill is not controlling a character, he applies his unused direct influence. He's not. So his unused is two. Uh, Emmerhill should get plus five if he has no followers to influence the knights. Direct influence plus modifier on the faction. So he's plus two, plus he has two unused, which is four, plus one because he's doing a Dan, and that's five. Is that what you're saying? Scott's saying he would get bonus on his card, plus unused influence, plus bonus on the faction, plus five. Troy's Million says that rulebook is that, yeah, it's more than just the rules. It actually has like several pages of actually walking you through how to play. And then it's got like 20 pages of like a card list, and then it's got like 15 or 20 different like uh, scenarios that you can play. Phil's Master saying that, that map looks sweet. Yeah, it's one of the most critical and best parts of this game. For sure. Um, so I think I'm at plus five, and I roll 2d6, right? Uh, so I basically need a three, and I got it. Uh, so I'm going to score Knights of Dol Amrith. I'm going to come over here. And that's going to... Do I tap the location or not? Come back to that in a second. And then over in the stones, um, I can play items minor, major, or greater. Okay, taps the location. Got it. Um, so we're going to try to play Narsal. And the, the Pucal Men, two strikes with nine prowess. And I have to be able to fend that off with these here characters. Let's try it. I'm going to attempt to play... Uh, Narsal at the stones. So I'll assign the strikes to Faramir and um, Annalena. Faramir is going to tap. Oh, someone's going to have to tap to play it. Am I right? Mm, those odds are bad. I think I'm going to wait until Aragorn can help me. So I won't play anything there. And I think we're clean. So. Uh, yeah, because the next automatic strike there is also a plus two from Choking Hazards, Choking Shadows. So we'll discard that because I'm not doing it. We'll go to the end of round. I can discard a card if I want. I will go ahead and discard a Reforging. And then I draw back to five. There's another copy of Gandalf. Is there anything I can do with that Gandalf? There's Glorfindel. He's good. He's just got big stats. Uh, then we'll go to the untapped phase. So Emrahil... Eowyn, Aragorn is back. 
and then now we go to the organization phase. What is next? I need information. I got to get uh, Andy Rill. So let's see where the nearest information is. I'm going to move these. Um, information. I am the information. Dunharrow over in Rohan. Have I used Dunharrow? I have not. So, that's not bad. And is there a major... Let me see where Arwen can go again with his choice of Luthien. She can go to Belfalas. So I think I'm going to end up sending Arwen and Imrahil somewhere safe. And then Gandalf and Eowyn are going to go collect Anduril somewhere. Aragorn staying to get the stones to get Narsil. And then Anduril is going to have to come from somewhere else. Dunharrow is not bad. Um, Amen Hen. Uh huh. Hmm. So they're staying. Do I split or not? So I think I'm going to send uh, Gandalf and Eowyn to Ammon Hen. They're going to stay in the stones, and then I'm going to send Arwen and Emrahil back to Minas Tirith. Okay, and then we'll actually go. Uh, let's start here with the stones because I know what I want to do. So I'm going to draw a card. I get a risky blow give him a pretty good strike. Uh, and then their hazard limit is three technically, so I'm going to make three rolls at the stones, which is minus one. I need an eight to cancel it. And these are all ruins and layers. So I need an eight. Got it. Cancel the first one. Need an eight. Uh, got a seven, so we'll get a ruins and layers, which is going to be dragon sickness. Playable on a character bearing a major or greater item. Character makes a corruption check modified by minus one. So I think uh, minor item, major item. I'll go with the one that uh, Faramir. It's going to make a corruption check. Mm, it's bad. Uh, he's got uh, three corruption, and he gets a minus one to the roll. So a seven minus one is a six. He's got three corruption, so he's fine. That could have been really bad. Uh, and then my third card, I need eight or better, and I got it, so I don't get a third card, so they are good. And then we'll go ahead and go um, Gandalf and Eowyn. They will go to Ammon Hen, so they're going to go free domains, free domains, 
free domains, M and hen. <laughs> so first is a free domains, and this is a minus one. I get to draw a card, technically. I have to discard, so we'll get rid of that extra copy again, though. Uh, Herman's name, hazard limit of plus two. I don't have uh, Imra Hill in this group anymore, so the hazard limit's not plus two right now. Right? I'm going to act like that's true for now. Need an eight. Got a seven. So this is going to be uh, free domains, which is here. Worn and famished. Each non-wizard character that is not in a haven, freehold, or border hold. Does not untap normally as a long event during his untap phase. Such a character may instead make a roll, and in his mind stat, if the result is greater than 12, he untaps. Can't be duplicated. So that's going to stay out. Herman says Gandalf's company. So is Gandalf, his direct influence, does he, he doesn't have a mind stat. So it says uh, Eyes of the Shadow. Hazard limit inc is increased by two for each moving company with a size of less than four that also contains a wizard or a non-ranger. Oh, is the with a mind of six or more only applying to the non-ranger? So their hazard limit's a four, and I'm moving a long way. So this is very risky. In that case, I'm actually, before I go to Ammon Hen, this whole group is just going to go to Minas Tirith. So I still failed that first test. But I'm essentially going uh, free domain, free domain into Minas Tirith. So I need Nate. I actually draw two, though. So we'll see what we get. And I got a block. Got a seven. So we get another free domain, which is here. Uh, permanent event, despair of the heart. Non-wizard, non-hobbit. Um, Oh, and I should have made that check with Aragorn. Am I getting eight? I didn't, so it's fine. Uh, Despair of the Heart, let's put it on Arwen. You know, star cross lovers. They broke up, hoping to get back together. And Dole Amos is going to go away. Uh, then we get to Miss Tyrant, so I'll make another because my hazard limit's four plus two, technically a six, but I'm hitting three locations. So this is going to be freeholds. I'll have to draw it. So this is just the tower here. Dragon Sickness, playable on a character bearing a major or greater item. Character makes a corruption check, minus one. So minor item, no. So it's Gandalf or Imrahil. We'll make it on Gandalf. So I'm minus one, plus one. I just make the roll. My corruption is a two currently. Need at least snake eyes, and I got an eight. So he's fine. And some of these cards could be really bad. Uh, and then they arrive at Minas Tirith, and then that's where we're at. So then now this, this group's going to enter the stones. Pukelmen, two strikes with nine prowess. I'm going to block with Faramir and Aragorn. Um, Aragorn is going to play a risky blow. So he gets plus three uh, prowess, which makes him a nine uh, to their nine. Got a 12, so I definitely pass. And then Faramir, and he actually, oh no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to play a block instead, and then I roll the 12. So basically I don't want to tap, because I want him to tap to get um, Narsal. And then Faramir will tap. He's at a 7, because he has that Sword of Gondolin. Um, and he will use the Risky Blow 
to make him a 10. That way I guarantee I pass. Got it. Uh, so I defeat that. I can now enter the location. So I will tap Aragorn to play Narsal, which is going to give him plus one. And we're getting ever closer to my master plan. Um, and that'll exhaust the stones. And then... Yeah. Luke says it's coming together. Um, all right. So we'll get to the end of the round. I can discard a card if I want. I will go ahead and get rid of Glorfindel. And then we'll draw back up. Risky Blow. Escape. And Vanishment. Not bad. Then... Uh, we're ready, uh, but I have worn and Famished out, which is a long event. Each non-wizard character that is not at a haven, freehold, or border hold. So I'm currently at a freehold in Minas Tirith, and I'm also at a Ruins and Lair over here. So they're going to be fine. Uh, they'll untap, but then here... Uh, such character may instead make a roll, adding his mind stat. If the result is greater than 12, he untaps. So Aragorn is at a 9. I need a 4 total for him to untap. He untaps. And then Faramir is at a 5, so I'm actually going to need an 8 for him to untap, which I didn't get. So Warn and Famish, that's pretty cool to see uh, that it is keeping Faramir tapped. Um, so you're having these random cards get generated, and they're actually creating negative effects for me. Uh, and then I'll go ahead and use, try to get rid of the Despair of Heart on Aragorn. So I need an 8. I didn't get it on R1. Need an 8. I failed both. So they're both just despairing. Longing. Okay. So now is the question. I st now I think I still want to take uh, Gandalf and probably Imrahil because the hazard limit is going to be increased anyway. I may as well get the bodies and Eowyn. So if I leave Arwen at Minas Tirith, she's still going to get a card. That goes away. Because what I essentially need to do now is go somewhere where information is playable and get uh, Anduril, and then I need to go store it at a haven. So I think it's the Dun, it's Amon Hen for sure, and that's on the way to Lorien. So Gandalf and the company are going to go to Amon Hen, but Arwen, if she leaves, I'm going to lose that choice of Luthien. So I need her to be with someone, probably Eowyn, so I can keep that scout. Uh, and warrior stat there. So they're probably going to stay at Minas Tirith. And then Gandalf and Emra Hill are probably going to go to the Dun Harrow to try to pick up Anduril. Then the next round they'll go to Lorien. Meanwhile, Aragorn and company aren't feeling so hot. But I can cancel out a strike in a forest. So... I think I basically want to get back to Arwen. Their hazard limit's a three, which is fine. So I think they just go wilderness, wilderness, uh, borderland, Minas Tirith. So that's where they're going to try to go. So I'm going to go Gandalf first. Yeah, Paul, don't draw a corruption card on Aragorn's company, eh? Gulp. Yeah, it would not be good. So I'm going to go Aragorn's crew first. They're going to try to move to uh, Minas Tirith. So it's going to be literally forest, forest, uh, borderlands, and then Minas Tirith. Um, so let's go forest first. And this is a two, so I'll get a draw two. There's Shadow Facts. Hmm. Hmm. 
and healing herbs. So, forest, forest, first. Uh, minus two, so I need a nine. There's one card, and it's coming from the forest. Oh no, Dwar of Wa. D W A R of W A W. That's our first Nazgul sighting. Creature or permanent event. Uh, it's going to be a permanent event. If played as a permanent event, it will remain in play until tapped during the opponent's movement hazard phase. When tapped, uh, it becomes a short event and gives plus one prowess to all wolf, spider, and animal attacks till the end of the turn. So that'll float until that's, that's playable. And then we'll go to the next forest. I need an eight or a nine. Got it. Then I'll go to the uh, borderlands. I need a nine. Got it. Then I'll actually go to Minas Tirith, which is a free hold. I need a nine. Didn't get it. Eight minus two is six. Yep. So Minas Tirith's going to put out a free hold card. That's the wrong one. Free hold. Greed. Till the end of turn, each non hobbit, non wizard at the site must make a corruption check each time an item is played. Uh, so it's going to go on Miss Terrence, but I'm not going to play any items, so that'll be fine. Uh, so they make it, which is good. And then I'm literally going to send these three. Um, now that I know Arwen has some friends over in Miss Terrence. Uh, up to Ammon Hen. So they're going to go free domains, free domains, aim and hen. And this is going to be a draw one, and I have to get rid of a card, I think. I'll go ahead and get rid of Ireth. Draw one, which is a concealment. I can tap a scout to cancel. And attack. Got an eight, minus one. I pass, so I don't get a bad card. We'll do it again. Got a seven, so I will actually get a free domains card, which is searching eye. Cancel any card requiring a scout skill before it is resolved, or cancel any ongoing effect of a card that required a scout to play. Nothing is going to happen there. Um, and then we actually get to Ammon Hen, which is Ruins and Layers. And I don't have to get a card for that because I rolled an eight. So they'll arrive, and then. Arrived, arrived. Arwen technically staying at Minas Tirith has to roll. And then I would get to draw. Now technically when you run out of deck, you would get to put uh, up to five cards from your sideboard in. So if I had a sideboard built, that's when I could do this. Scott, thanks for being with us. Glad you're enjoying it. Matt, I actually really like the uh, Nazgul art. So like their faces are like different creatures. I like it a lot. Chris Davis saying, Lore of Power would be a good include in the Freehold deck. Um, Freehold. I think it's in there. Let me look real quick. There's an Assassin. Yes. Okay. So... Uh, Ammon Hen, Arwen, I get a roll for Arwen. Failed, so I get a bad card at Menace Tirith, which is going to be a freehold. Uh, Stormcrow, the direct influence of my uh, wizard is reduced by two. There's two of these out now. Oh, you know what? The first one went away because it, you discard it when any uh, deck would be exhausted. So now we'll just get the new one. Um, and then that was it. I made it everywhere I was going. So Arwen's going to stay there. She's actually going to, in the site phase, uh, join up back with her hubby. And Minas Tirith. Let's do this. Stones are gone. I exhausted them, so they're gone, gone. Annalena, I'm going to move these up here on top of Mordor. Who, who needs Mordor anyway? Um, okay, 
So then at M and Hen, I can play information. Undead, one strike with six prowess. Each character wounded must make a corruption check. So I will suffer that automatic attack. And it's undead, which Dwarvois doesn't uh, affect. So it's just going to be a six. I will go ahead and uh, block with Emra Hill. So he's a five to a six. I can't fail. So I pass it. I strike. Then I'm going to exhaust Gandalf. Actually, you know what? Yeah, just hope he doesn't get corrupted. Uh, to put Anduril, Flame of the West on him. And it says, unique, sage only. Uh, during the site phase, an untapped site where information is playable. Tap the sage in the site. Uh, keep sage tapped until Anduril is stored at a haven. Once stored, you may discard a stored reforging and place Anduril with Narsal. In addition to Narsal's effect, Anduril gives us bear four marshaling points, four prowess, etc. Um, oh, Andrew also has uh, may be tapped to untap a Dunedan, Dunedan character in the same company, but its bearer makes a corruption check of minus one. So that could be really good. Uh, so I played it. I can also technically play a minor item. Um, sure. I'll tap uh, Eowyn, and we'll put healing herbs there just in case. And it's nice because I have the Elven Cloak and the Healing Herbs and I'm getting ready to go through the forest to get to Lorien, which I'm a fan of. So I played that out. I get to keep my whole hand. I wish I had a little more time because I could go to Dunharrow and get Shadow Facts. But I don't. So I'm not going to. Uh, then that's the end of the round. So already I can technically discard a card and draw one if I want. Let's see if anything... I'm not going to get to play Shadow Facts as much as I want to, but I'll keep it in my hand just in case I get frisky. Uh, ready. Now, something. Minus two influence. Eyes of Shadow. Uh, also, Eyes of Shadow gets discarded when I exhausted my deck earlier. So I'm down to Stormcrow and Dwar of Wa, uh, which could matter in a second when I'm going through this forest. So let's... I'm Obviously, I'm going to send... Uh, Gandalf to Lorien. Because that is a haven. And that's how I'm going to get my sword. Like in the movies, Elrond's going to forge it. Oh yeah, and side note, when I shuffle my deck earlier, all of the exhausted locations actually technically come back, right? Catch me on that if I'm wrong, chat. Uh, someone asked him I passed the corruption check for playing Andrew. Let me make sure I have to. Corruption check modified by minus three. Oh boy, oh boy. Slipped. Appreciate that. Good luck. Have, enjoy work. Good luck. Hopefully you enjoy it. Okay, the locations come back. So they're going to try to go to Lorien. But before I do that, I have to make a corruption check. So Gandalf is at... Uh, two corruption points. He gets plus one to his roll, but it's minus three. So it's a minus two. I got a 12. Gandalf was ready to party. And then um, they move to Lorien. So it's going to be starting in Rohan which is a free domain. And then we're going to go through the Wald and Foothills, which is Wilderness, and DeLorean. So free domain, Wilderness. Starting with free domain, got a six. So I'll actually get a card. Uh, and it's actually Borderlands, my bad. So Borderlands, Worn and Famished, each non-wizard character that's not at a haven, etc. It's a long event. So that's the one where they don't untap. Um, then I'll roll again for Wilderness, and this is a, I forgot to draw, two. Dodge and a block. So I need a nine. Got an 11. So I won't get the second card, and they're going to show up at Lorien, but Ammon Hen is exhausted. And then uh, Minas Tirith crew is just going to hang out at Minas Tirith. Um, Although I could send a party to go get Shadow Facts. 
I don't want to risk it. It depends. If we were in a game, right? Because uh, I don't think I have an ally out. I don't. So if my opponent had an ally out, it would be super critical for me to go get Shadow Effects. Um, and technically, they should have both made their check. I'm going to go Arwen first to get rid of that uh, Despair of the Heart. She did it with an 8. And I think this is where that was. And then Aragorn will do the same. He did it. They literally are back together and rejoicing. That's awesome. That's so thematic, it pains me how hilarious. They split up, they both got despair, and then they got back together and the despair is gone. Philip saying, loving this so much, I'm in the middle of reading The Hobbit currently. That's awesome. I'm rereading Lord of the Rings. I'm listening to the audiobook technically. And uh, I've just been in a real Lord of the Rings kick, which is part of why I'm playing this today. What up, Phoenix Fox? Um, yeah, it is amazing, right? It's so cool. Matt saying perfect storytelling. Yeah, it's just fantastic. Um, all right, let's see. They're in Lorien. Um, now, if I want to, before I go to Lorien, we're going here. I'm going to try to go get Shadow Facts. We're going to send Faramir and Annalena over to uh, Dunharrow. So let's get Dunharrow out. Because I have all these things to cancel attacks. I'm going to let Aragorn and Arwen be king and queen for a bit. Just hanging out. Uh, so they're going to Dunharrow. <clears throat> which is going to be from Minas Tirith. Um, free domains. Free domains. And then Dunharrow. So first one, I'm going to draw a card. It's a Gandalf. I need an eight. Got a seven, so it's gonna be a free domains. Seven. No, that's actually gonna be yeah, free domains. Weirdness of the heart. The prowess of a character is modified by minus one till the end of the turn. Alternatively, the target character is forced to make a corruption check. Cannot be duplicated. So let's uh, just make uh, Faramir a minus one. It seems like the worst thing for me. Uh, then I'm going to move to Anorian, so I'm going to roll, got an 8, so I don't get a card, and then we'll actually move to the Dunharrow, got an 8, so I don't get a card. So Annalena and Faramir, I'm going to move that up here, are at the Dunharrow, and we'll bring Faramir's back, a little token, see if they can go get Gandalf's horse while Gandalf's getting Aragorn a sword. And then Aragorn and Arwen are going to stay in Minas Tirith. And so they're going to roll for a free domains. And they're going to get it. they got to deal with problems back at the castle. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Many sorrows befall. Unique forces the discard of one resource long event. Uh, I don't have any of those out. Alternatively, can target and cancel one resource short event declared earlier in the same chain of effects. So that's not going to do anything, but I do love that art. Uh, so they're going to hang out at Minas Tirith. So that happens. Now we get to the site phase. Uh, Gandalf is going to be at Lorien. And I'm going to read Anduril again. Uh, oh, keep Sage tapped. So technically Gandalf's tapped. Uh, until it's stored at a haven. Once stored, I can discard Reforging and place Anduril with Narsal. So I'm going to try to store this. Um, now hit me up again with the store. Tresmillion says, who's your narrator? That's me. Uh, I'm going to try to store Anduril. Let me read these rules again. There's all these little nooks and crannies. Of the rules. Oh, no, I can't store it till next round. Them's the beats. So they're just going to hang out. Uh, and we'll go to the end of the round. So, actually, no. They're at Dunharrow. So I get to play Shadow Facts. Let's read Shadow Facts. He says, unique, playable at Edoras or Dunharrow. If his company has only one character or one character and a hobbit at the end of the movement phase, uh, tap Shadow Facts to allow his company to immediately move again. Additional sight card may be played. An additional movement hazard phase follows. So you can basically move twice with Shadow Facts. Um, and I will exhaust uh, Annalena. 
to play Shadow Fangs on her. And then I'll exhaust the Dun Hero. All right, then we'll go to the end phase. Uh, I can discard a card, so I'll get rid of the Gandalf card. Uh, Luke asking, did you put in the other horses uh, from the white hand? I don't, but they're on my short list. I really should. Oh, Tresmine, the narrator on the audiobook. Uh, it's the main audiobook. It's got like 50,000 reviews on Audible. Um, I can look at it real quick just to give you accurate information. Uh, looks like it is. Um, huh. Narrative by Rob Inglis. And it's super good. Oh, it's starting to play. He has different voices for every character, and he sings and stuff. It's, it's really quite fantastic. He keeps wanting to play. I don't know why it keeps doing that. <laughs> I swear, every time I put it in my pocket, it starts playing. It's cursed. I didn't hear that, Matt. That's awesome. I'm saying there's apparently an audiobook of The Hobbit with Andy Serkis as a narrator coming. Philip saying, Rob Inglis singing his bombadil is some of the must-listen radio. Yeah, it's super good. Um, all right, so I moved. I got Shadow Facts. I did my thing. Started the turn. Gandalf doesn't untap, but I'm going to try to store Anduril. So I think I just make a corruption check. Which my corruption point total is a three at this point. I'm plus one. So technically, I don't think I can fail. Let me look. All right, uh, corruption value. You can tap, untap characters to add plus one. Roll 2d6. The result for each character is tapped is greater than control points, something happens. So basically, I have three corruption points because I have Glamdring, which has the corruption on the bottom right of one, Healing Herbs, which is one, and Roll, which is one. So it's three, but I have a, a plus one on my roll. So the worst I can do is a three. And if it's equal, I have to discard the character. So I'm going to tap. Ewan to add plus one to my corruption check to store Anduril. And I got a five, so I do it. So when I store Anduril, it says, uh, once stored, you can discard a stored reforging, so I will, to put Anduril with Narsal. So I basically forge Narsal into Anduril Flame of the West. And that is uh, going to give him plus four which is a lot, two, three, four. So Aragorn is a plus five to a cap of 11. So he's literally at an 11 prowess. He has Narsal, Anduril, an Elven Cloak, and he has been returned and given the crown, the King of Gondor. So that is pretty sweet. So I've done it all. I think I've literally done everything. Um, let me look at my deck and see if there's anything else left for me to score. I have a reforging, and that's it. So uh, this is a, I'm going to take a second uh, to look at what's happened here. I started in Lorien, I believe. No, Rivendell. And I found Gandalf very quickly, uh, which was good. But I got a reforging, learned how to smith with sword, just in case. Um, and then I defeated some enemies, some brigands, some ghouls, a wisp of the pale sheen. Um, I went uh, to Ga or Minas Tirith. Uh, Arwen made her choice, the choice of Luthien. Aragorn was returned as king, which is awesome. Meanwhile, Faramir and Annalena were off uh, finding stuff for me. So then they uh, found uh, the Sword of Gondolin. And then Aragorn... And Eowyn went to the Vale of Eric uh, to do nothing. But then Gandalf and Imrahil went down to Dol Amrath to influence the Knights of Dol Amrath, brought them back to Minas Tirith. Uh, then they went and found 
I guess they found Anduril. They, they found the techniques they needed to reforge the sword. Went up to Lorien, reforged the sword, brought it down to King Aragorn, and thus is the history of Aragorn the uh, second. And for a point total really quick, I scored two with Glamdring, uh, one with Choice of Luthien, four with Anduril. Is it plus four points? Just four total, so four, five, six, seven. Two with Sword of Gondolin, eight, nine. One with Shadow Effects is 10. Narsal is 3, so that's 13. Return of the King is 3, so that's 16. Um, plus, I scored Knights of Dull Amrith is 19. I killed three one point enemies, so that's going to be 22. Plus, I have two for Emrahil. Uh, 24, one for Arwen, 25, three for Aragorn is 28, one for Annalena, which is 29, two for Faramir, which puts me at 31, and I do believe that that is all of my points. So going through my deck, uh, a little past once, I scored 31 points, and I basically achieved everything that I was uh, setting out to achieve. And I think... Um, the, you know, when you're looking at your deck, like your sideboard, that's where that becomes really critical. Because I can see, even just playing this one game, right, normally you'd have to, like, meet up with someone and they would have to know what's going on. And uh, in this way, I felt like I had a, a pretty good challenge. There were a couple moments where, like, I had Dragon Sickness and uh, a, a handful of Dragon Sicknesses happened and Greeds that could have really been, and Call of Home, there were a couple moments where it could have gone real south for me. It was, there was tension there. Uh, but the main thing that I got to see, right, is like I spent time going up. I forgot. Uh, Faramir mistakenly went to Mount Graham early on. Uh, but I got to basically see the locations that I wanted to visit, uh, how to actually make it happen, and then the restriction of Choice of Luthien once that was on Arwen. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, I'm, I'm really curious about what everyone um, here thought that was watching because I feel like that was a, a great uh, sparring match. Like I think... Um, I saw a lot of enemies. If I hadn't been playing heavy, like Elven Cloak, um, Dodge, Block, Vanishment, Concealment, which not every deck is going to do, um, I was seeing a ton of cards. And I had the really good Stealth, where um, I had Stealth on a big move, where I was going to see like set three or four cards. Um, Luke G saying, how do you feel about Choice of Luthien after playing it? So... Ultimately, Choice of Luthien to me is huge in the event that you can't play Return of the King. Like if, if your opponent is just on Denethor for whatever reason, then it's your permanent event point. And then as a permanent event, what it lets you do, because like Return of the King gives you plus three direct influence with Aragorn, which gets him up to a six, uh, which means he can actually just directly influence um, wherever it's at. Uh, Imrahil and... A couple of other characters. So, like, they can basically be a big, bad team. And I think this next stage of the deck is what I need to work out. But uh, that allows him to be your main direct influencer. But flip, flip that is that, like, if you don't see Return of the King early, or if they just have um, Denethor out, uh, or they get rid of it in some way, then Choice of Luthien means that you can score the permanent event category. And Arwen can now directly influence Aragorn, uh, which is which could be super significant depending on how the game goes. Um, so I, I think they're both totally reasonable. It, the cool thing about Choice of Luthien too, it's not exactly like hard to get into play. So even if you have to end up using Arwen to leave Minas Tirith or that region, you just lose one point, and then you can potentially get back around to it. I also totally forgot on Choice of Luthien, outside of it looking phenomenal. Uh, I would love that as a playmat. Uh, but anyways, it's, you can tap Arwen to take an item, ally, or a faction playable at her current site from your play deck or discard pile into hand. So the other thing that lets you do is like if you have sideboard cards at the end and you're just like farming for points waiting to get through your deck a second time, one, she let, like if I didn't just draw Shadow Facts at the end, she would let me just go get it immediately. Uh, or, because it, it's an ally, right? Take an item, ally, or faction. Or I could have a handful of factions over in my sideboard. And then, like, towards the end there, right, it's like I could tap Gandalf. I have a pretty full deck to put a faction in my deck. And then I could tap Arwen to immediately go get it. Um, and just, like, I think you could really put on the gas there at the end with her just being queen and Aragorn king in Minas Tirith. 
and just go farm points uh, as, as fast as you can. Uh, Smeagol says, doubling marshaling points for categories only applies to items, allies, and factions. Okay, that's good to know. I didn't know that. Matt says, thanks again for doing this, Zach. I really enjoyed it. I'm sure I'll rewatch a good amount of this for learning purposes. There's a lot. There, there's a lot to, of just like it's particular steps and roles and checks and things that you can do. But once you start getting the hang of it, I think you start getting a feel for like the architecture of the system. I do think that like I, if, if I were designing it today, and we might talk about this on the podcast at some point, um, I would find a way to make all of the rules kind of function 10% more similarly. So like when you're looking for, like the prowess body check to me, there's no reason for that not to be, I'm making both roles and I'm looking to get higher than or lower than a certain number every time instead of kind of flipping it and reversing it. But yeah, I, I think uh, when I get to like really knowing what I'm doing, Choice of Luthien to go get a card, uh, Gandalf to put a card in your deck and Arwen to immediately go get it, I feel like that's super powerful. Matt's saying it really helps to see instead of just reading the rulebook. Yeah, that was the thing for me. I read the rulebook several times um, before playing, and then even playing that first time with Steven, it took us five or six hours to just like walk through a game. And so it's a lot. It's, I'm a visual learner as well, so that's, that's a big reason why I wanted to do this. I, I feel like this is a great game. It's beautiful. You can get those challenge decks pretty easy, and it's a game that uh, with a little bit of work, I feel like I can play pretty reasonably uh, solo. And it's the kind of thing, too, like if it's, if it's not challenging enough for you, and I'll flip up to the top. Uh, and Bryce, I'll stop popping cards if you want to bail and go live your life. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm going to look again. I'm going to play this a handful more times solo ultimately and maybe make some tweaks. But I, I feel pretty happy with, with how it played out. How do you guys feel about the like rolling to see if you get the card in the first place? I really liked, uh, I think it was Ryan Roper who was saying that like, basically start with your first location and make checks all along the way. And you give yourself more opportunities for checks, which is probably going to work out to feeling about, about like the number of cards you would actually see in a game. Luke G, are you and Steven going to play Ring Wraith sometime? Yeah, I have those those Ring Wraith decks. Um, I want to play them at some point, uh, but this is this is kind of like just being able to get in the Thunderdome and test something out. I don't know exactly how those Ring Wraiths work. Um, I know that you can. Uh, there's some bizarre stuff going on. So before I added more complexity, I definitely want to build a Fallen Wizard and a Ring Wraith deck. Um, like I think having a Saruman Fallen Wizard makes a lot of sense to me. That'd be pretty cool having like a good Gandalf deck, a good you know Saruman who actually fell, um, and then ultimately wanting to have like a Witch King deck. I know the Balrog decks are like insane expensive, um, so we'll see. I think the Ring Race stuff too. I think in a head to head is probably more interesting. Uh, let's see. Jonathan says I like it a lot. Seems true to the two player. Yeah, I, I think that's the the thing about that that's interesting and I, I'm kind of getting a feel for it. I think this is good like sparring, like to kind of learn your deck. But the tension in the game, I didn't really... Th with the Lord of the Rings TCG background, um, it, it didn't... Uh, I assumed coming in that it would be a little more adversarial where I'm trying to defeat you and you're trying to defeat me because you're throwing bad stuff at your opponent, but it really, the more I, I see it, it's like, it's you're just trying to slow him down. And the real scoreboard is how many points each player has, which is pretty cool, because it's a heads-up game that can be multiplayer that is head-to-head, -head, but it's not fully head-to-head. -head. You know, like it's, like, it's sort of like you're fighting each other, but you're really telling a story out here, and you're watching the other person's points tick up as as you're figuring yours out. And it's, it's cool, like the influence, like if I have a character out you can't play it and then like if if i have at the same place as you i can try to influence your character and take them it's pretty cool smeagol says over in the facebook group i posted all the deck lists for my deck building project it currently has 36 resource decks so you're saying is resource the good guy stuff or is that just 36 deck lists ryan rober says is less direct conflict and more causing trouble causing i totally agree 
Jonathan A. saying in solo, you could throw more enemies into the decks to make it harder uh, where you might die. There's a, there's a lot of enemies in my decks. I basically, like if we look at this uh, forest or wilderness stack, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So it's like over half on the wilderness front is creatures. And some of these, there's not as many creatures to the key to it. Um, I wanted enemies to show up when I'm hitting those numbers uh, because like the most devastating turns in the game are when your opponent plays a couple enemies on you. But I didn't want it to be so, like at first it was literally, I went through three places and I have three characters, I get three cards. And that was too much, um, too consistently. Because uh, taking some wounds sometime is bad, but like I would find myself, like I did some very quick test runs I'd move three, take three cards, uh, someone would get wounded. And then I'd move one or two, take two cards, because I have three characters. And then someone else gets wounded, and all of a sudden I'm like trapped, and I can't do anything. Scott saying, with a variety of hazard decks to combo them with, he's done an amazing job putting them all together. Oh, hey, are you talking about me? Who are you talking about? Scott says, so jealous. Oh, Smeagol saying... 36 deck lists, deck lists for heroes, uh, free, what's FW? Minions, Balrog in total, uh, 36 hazard decks. So you have 36 uh, he free peoples and 36 hazard decks that you can smash together. Jason's saying, I like the idea that each player is doing something different in this game on the same map, totally. Yeah, that's cool. I'll have to check that out, Smeagol. Um, is that just on the Facebook group? It's not on a website or anything? Oh, FW's Fallen Wizard. Very cool. Uh, Un Unwound Attic asking, how'd you build your hazard decks? Was it just whatever hazards you had for the location or region, or did you build them to counter your decks? So a little bit of both. Um, basically, what I did is I went through all of the... Uh, what's the bad guy cards called? Hazard cards, there it is. All the hazard cards. And I was looking for any card that had a generic effect that could apply to me if it was flipped at random. And then I was also looking for any creatures that key to that region. So as an example, my wilderness stack, um, like one of the cards is lost in the wilderness. Uh, any company moving this turn, uh, you can play one additional hazard on that company for each wilderness on their site path. So uh, on that one, I was going to resolve it where it's like, this one doesn't count, and then I get a new one, and then plus one because it's it's I'm lost in the wilderness, uh, or like you know Storm Crow is a, a generic, and I, I made a pile of all of the cards that were generically bad, and I basically like would put like you know there's I think there's a Storm Storm Crow or whatever that was called, Hold on. Uh, yeah the Storm Crow, which is the minus two direct influence on my wizard. I think there's one of those in pretty much every deck, and these decks are about 30, 35 cards each. Um, so it's possible I could hit multiple of those in the same turn, or I could hit, you know, just randomly hit those throughout my sessions. Um, and then creatures just had to have the, at least one of the icon keyed, and I was I was going to be willing to play it. it did, I didn't need to do the, like, if there's two forests, I have to key two forests or whatever. Uh, but yeah, I, I was aiming for, when possible, 30-ish uh, cards in each hazard deck, so that way it wasn't too consistent. I went a little heavier on the locations I expected to see a lot of, um, which includes Wilderness and also um, Shadowlands and Ruins and Layers because I'm just going to see those a lot. Um, and then looking for 30 cards, I was about half creatures in most of those decks. Um, and that was about it because I'm, I'm, I was trying to mimic the math that you see on most deck lists online. Cool. Uh, well, uh, any last questions before I get out of here? Uh, it's been a fun stream. I got really locked into that game, and I was going. I hope you guys all enjoyed seeing it. I definitely dig the ability to just kind of roam around and go wherever I want and then have random bad stuff happen to me. Kind of like, you know, in the movies and the books and whatnot, Sauron's obviously orchestrating some bad stuff, but you just run, run into wolves or goblins or whatever is out there. Luke, appreciate it. Uh, Parker saying, uh, uh, looks like it was a lot of fun. It was. It was cool. It, it's cool, especially with isolation, having a game this beautiful that you can just kind of fall into and tell a story. Like, it was so good. My, literally, both Aragorn and Arwen got despair after separating. Uh, they became king and queen, forging the sword. Um, like, the whole, there's just a lot of thematic moments here. Smeagol saying, definitely, please, more of this. 
Uh, Ryan says event hazards. Yeah, I have a lot of those. You saw the permanents kind of start stacking up. I wanted that feeling too of like this, like permanents are good because even if they're just kind of bad for you, enough of them stacked up could get really bad. Philip saying, how does this compare to going solo with Lord of the Rings LCG? Um, I've never played Lord of the Rings LCG solo, but I definitely, the my biggest complaint about Lord of the Rings LCG is that it's very linear by, by design, right? You go from... Or uh, basically encounter one, two, three, right? You're progressing in the story in that way. So the thing I really like about Miller CCG in general is the map um, and the open world nature of it. So when I I recognized that there wasn't a solo version of the game that really leans into that open open world environment, uh, that's where this this whole idea came from. I wanted to be able to sit down, look at the map of Middle Earth have my uh, team, and then just go exploring, right? Uh, no no holds barred. If I want to go over to Menace Morgul, right, I might run into some Nazgul, or if I want to go to Mount Doom and try to dunk the ring, uh, I might run into, uh, you know, some bad bad cats. So that was definitely... Uh, it's a very different game than the Lord of the Rings LCG. I, uh, Lord of the Rings LCG is way more accessible and <laughs> friendly to get into, and it's super fun. Uh, as a cooperative game, uh, but ultimately the stories in that are just a lot more linear uh, than than in this. Matt says, uh, my favorite part was when you played Choice of Luthien after Arwen got wounded. Yeah, her choosing to be a mortal after being wounded um, was was pretty great. Ryan Rober saying, generic hazards in a deck for havens is what I was saying. Yeah, I think I have uh, hazards that are... I basically literally like went through all the bad cards, the hazards, and I divided the creatures up by where they were keyed. And then like if I had like five of a creature um, and it had three icons on it, right, I would put one in all three. But then I started looking at like... I wanted to make sure if you were in certain areas you were seeing orcs or if you were in certain areas you were seeing like spiders and wolves in the forest uh, and that kind of thing. So I... I it's a balance of like a lot of times you aren't going to go through like four, four, four wilderness in the same turn. So I wanted cards to be synergistic. Um, so, you know, there are some goblins that might show up in the wilderness because if you hit a couple in a row, the, the cards can start stacking up in a really bad way for you. Matt saying, I love the Lord of the Rings LCG, but this is definitely more of an open world. The LCG is very focused. Yeah. Chris says, typically playing versus an opponent, leaving characters at a haven allows them to place cards on guard, which allows them to draw more cards against your other companies. That makes sense. Yeah, for those asking, the Lord of the Rings LCD is a cooperative uh, non uh, card game based in Middle Earth uh, by Fantasy Flight Games. Incredible art in that game, too. Very different style. Yeah, Chris, I mean, you could probably take it that far where you start emulating the storing of cards, but on some level, um, it's just going to be too complex. Uh, Unwound saying, do you think you could be able to build your hazard decks with just the challenge decks? You know, I'm honestly not sure. I don't know. I, I do know that I was able to build them off of basically one box of wizards and one box of... Uh, Dragons, roughly. Like, it wasn't that much. Um, so, I I bet you could at least get close. And I think there's a way, too, of, like, building it where, you know, you might have... Uh, <laughs> Chris says too complex. Yeah, I mean, basically, if you stack the custom rules on top of the custom rules on top of the standard rules... Um, it's just getting like, and you know, if you're playing at home and you want to simulate even more like you're playing a real person, I think that's totally fine. And you could also, you know, be, you could be the AI where it's like, well, if you were your opponent, what would you do um, in that kind of situation? Smeagol says the 10 challenge decks provide a good mix. Yeah, I mean, what do you think, Smeagol? You think you could take the hazard cards in the challenge decks and build uh, a deck for each basically region and site type? Yeah, he's saying it should easily make a good base for a solo region hazard deck. 
The challenge decks are great, honestly. Yeah, he's saying, yeah, definitely. Very cool. Well, hey, I've appreciated you all being here. Smeagol, Ryan, Chris, everyone Chris, other Chris. Uh, this was great. I had a lot of fun. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and hopefully this is helpful if you're watching it. Um, if you aren't already aware, we have a content membership on the website. That's how we're able to do stuff like this, stream and have the cards pop and do all this kind of stuff. Uh, and we really appreciate it, just you being here and being a part of this. Hopefully this was helpful and fun. And if you're new to Middle Earth CCG, there's a great community on Facebook. Check out that Facebook group. They've been super helpful. And uh, if you play solo, end up letting me know in the comments. I'd love to hear from you. Um, and if this video was helpful, I'd also love to hear about it. So thanks for being here. I'm going to zoom in on way downtown here on the outro. Hold on. Hopefully I get this right. Um... And we're going to get out of here because I've been talking for like four or five hours straight. Jonathan, also thank you so much for being here. Hopefully you, uh, this was helpful. I know you bought into some decks lately. Smeagol saying thumbs up. Really appreciate it. Uh, Brad saying pretty much you're playing Middle Earth. You're playing solo. There's a bunch of people in that group. And there's a bunch of people locally that I'm excited to play with once we're not in isolation anymore. Jason, see you later. Uh, Matt, anytime. Thank you guys so much for being here. You're the best. Stay safe out there. And we'll catch you guys next time. Uh, also, th Thursdays we've been in throwbacks, so if you like these old card games, join us on a future throwback. Uh, we'll catch you guys later.